Welcome. Uh, this is the FCC's first workshop in the Universal Service Intercarrier Compensation Reform Proceeding. Welcome to those uh, in the room, those joining online, where the workshop, uh, like all of our workshops, is being live streamed. We have uh, great panels lined up today. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, a number of people, uh, knowing that I won't be able to thank everyone. Uh, but a special thanks to Krista Tanner from the Iowa Utilities Board, Peter McGowan, the General Counsel for the New York State Department of Public Service, uh, and to all of our panelists for taking the time to be with us here today. I know uh, many of you have traveled a, a great distance to be here. I, uh, you're probably feeling lucky that you didn't have to travel yesterday, which would not have been that much fun. Uh, but I appreciate your commitment uh, to being here with us in this room where a lot of sleeves will be rolled up today looking to get some work done. Uh, let me uh, again thank the staff of the FCC, uh, both those who organized this particular event uh, and the team that's been working on USF and ICC reform uh, for some time now and making uh, just wonderful progress. Why are we here? We're here for a simple reason. The intercarrier compensation system is broken and fixing it is vital to achieving our country's broadband goals. The ICC system was created decades ago for a telephone network that no longer exists. In the face of dramatic changes in market and technologies, the current ICC system is actually impeding the transition to all IP networks and distorting investment incentives. There's no defense of a tangled ICC system acting as an obstacle to bringing the benefits of broadband to all Americans. That's why reform designed to remove impediments and modernize the system is critical now. Now, ICC reform is a top priority for all of us on the Commission. Not easy. It's been tried several times over the last decade. But when this Commission voted unanimously to move forward with reform earlier this year, and again in an unprecedented unanimous blog post, by all five commissioners a few weeks ago, we made clear that we are all committed to reform and to moving to order soon, within a few months of the completion of the record in May. With that timing in mind, today is the day to discuss the path forward on intercarrier compensation reform. I look forward to a healthy discussion from our panelists and other participants, and I expect stakeholders to work together to find common ground, not to rest, on old talking points. A couple more points. First, I appreciate the efforts many states have taken to reform state access charges. I'm particularly pleased that Tennessee and Washington State have recently taken steps to reduce access charges. These states join more than a dozen others, including Nebraska, Kansas, Michigan, Iowa, Texas, Georgia, that are leaders on ICC reform. I call on other states to follow these states' lead and take on the challenge of intrastate access reform. Such efforts are an essential part of the reform process, and we can learn from them as we work together to do the rest of the work necessary to achieve comprehensive reform. Second, good policy making requires good data. And nowhere is that more true than intercarrier compensation reform. I'm committed, as we all are, to data-driven policymaking, and this reform process is no exception. I encourage everyone affected by ICC reform, both ICC payors and payees, to file the ICC data requested in our Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Some stakeholders, some stakeholders have already filed the requested data, and I thank you for doing so. Others have not. Now, we will move forward with reform using the best data we have. Stakeholders that don't provide data face real risks. Without your data, without the data we need to evaluate your positions, including claims of need for universal service support, those positions have little chance of shaping our ultimate reforms. So again, thank you to all of you for participating in this important workshop. I want to thank uh, all of my colleagues uh, who have agreed to participate. I see uh, Commissioner Copps, uh, I saw him, Commissioner Clyburn, Commissioner Baker, Commissioner McDowell. Uh, before I uh, turn the floor over to my colleague, Commissioner Copps, I want you all to know that um, uh, 
Uh, Commissioner Cobbs, when we were talking about USF and ICC reform, I guess a couple of month ag months ago as we were uh, preparing to move forward on the notice, uh, said um, uh, we should think very seriously about organizing stakehold to stakeholders together in a process of workshops where people will work up their sleeves and get things done. Uh, uh, and uh, it was exactly uh, the kind of thing that the staff uh, and I had been thinking about. All of the commissioners agree on this. Commissioner Copps, I want to thank you for, uh, for pushing us, uh, as you always do. Uh, and with that, let me hand the floor over to Commissioner Michael Copps. Thank you very much. Is this on? I can talk from here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your leadership in getting us all here today and for teeing this up for uh, action. Uh, if we can get this done, and I think we will, it's going to be a historic achievement of uh, considerable magnitude. I am delighted to be here this morning. I am even more delighted to see all of you good uh, folks here. This is uh, uh, an important meeting that can set us on the road to a viable system of intercarrier compensation and universal service reform. So. Uh, uh, so I'm just happy to uh, be a part of it. Uh, I think the blog posting that the chairman mentioned kind of said it all uh, and indicated to everybody that the commission is dead serious about getting this done this year, getting it done long before the end of this year. Uh, to do that, it's going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice on all of our uh, uh, parts. But we begin today uh, with our work toward a viable system. Uh, we're not here to discuss Christmas uh, wish lists or things like that. I think we're here all cognizant of the fact that we're approaching an end game on this, and this is a time to really get down to the uh, uh, remaining differences that do uh, 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 that are still out there and calling for uh, attention. We all know the intercarrier compensation system is Byzantine. It's broken, as the chairman said. Uh, Yet we all know that it's been around for a long period of time and it's part of the system and has a long history and as we move ahead we have to be cognizant uh, of that history and sensitive to the needs to a transition plan that will move us uh, sensibly and rationally with minimum dislocation toward a more viable system in the future. Uh, I also want to uh, uh, agree with what the uh, chairman said about the important role that the states should be uh, playing and will be playing and already are playing uh, as we move these, uh, these important items forward. Uh, we've got to come up with a system that's got some credibility. What we have now has no, has, um, uh, no credibility here, no credibility on Capitol Hill, no credibility in the financial markets, no credibility with the American people. So we've got, we've got some considerable work to do. Uh, and with that, uh, I'll turn the uh, uh, microphone over to others, but uh, uh, again, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, Commissioner McDowell is here. Commissioner, uh, I guess, uh, can I say a few words? Just to keep you all guessing, I'll do it from up here. How does that sound? Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. You have a very full, long day ahead of you. I hope that if you uh, find that you have differences of opinion, that you continue to work, work through them. Uh, as I was listening to my friend and colleague, Mike Copps, speaking, I was reminded of the fall of 2008, which on the one hand doesn't seem like that long ago, on the other hand seems like a decade ago. Uh, but where four commissioners, two Republicans, two Democrats, of which he and I were a part, came, uh, well, we came to agreement on some many of the thornier issues on intercarrier cop and universal service reform. And unfortunately, it just didn't happen. So here we are today. Um, and uh, we need to go forward. Uh, I want us to go forward as quickly as possible. Of course, I've been saying for some time now that I think uh, we should be tackling uh, distribution and contribution, intercarrier compensation all at the same time. Uh, I've said many times it's become a cliche at this point. It's sort of like fixing a watch. It's hard to uh, tinker with one component of it without affecting all the other components. But if we're going to uh, start off with the, the distribution side, I'm all for that. Uh, let's get it, get it tackled. You know, as I see the trees budding here in Washington, this is one of my favorite times of year, except for the allergies it gives me. But anyway, that's another story. Uh, but uh, it's absolutely beautiful time of year. As we see the, that newness, that new green coming out of the trees, uh, maybe we can all make a pledge today that we can have uh, 
agreement on comprehensive universal service and intercarrier compensation reform before those leaves fall off those trees this year. Uh, so I hope you'll all pledge with me to do just that. But uh, the system is bloated. It is antiquated. It is inefficient. Um, it is broken. And the inability of government to resolve this issue is part of what makes uh, people cynical about the ability of government to solve basic problems. This is one of the fundamental duties of the Federal Communications Commission, is to solve the universal service and intercarry compensation problem. Congress charted uh, this and it was the last time around over 15 years ago uh, through Section 254. Um, I, I, it's important to listen to all stakeholders, but there's no particular constituency we should be worried about other than the American consumer, because at the end of the day, it's American consumers who contribute to a subsidy uh, that then others receive uh, in, in theory to, uh, to help uh, subsidize other consumers. Um, but um, we, uh, we need to go forward and do this uh, quickly uh, because uh, if not, then we're not doing our basic jobs uh, as public servants and uh, that would be uh, shameful if we can't come to agreement. So um, I don't think we also should uh, wait for Congress. Um, I respect uh, the advice from Congress, but if, if the House and the Senate want to agree on legislation and the President wants to sign it, I will dutifully uh, implement it. But uh, we've spent 15 years waiting for Congress to revise universal service. Um, and it hasn't happened, so we should go forward. It is our duty, it's what Congress has told us to do through the plain language of the statute, and uh, we should go forward and do that as quickly as possible. So in a way, I feel as if we should close the doors and lock them and not let uh, anyone leave until this problem is solved today. Uh, realistically, I know that's not going to happen, but I, I do hope it will happen uh, before the leaves fall off the trees. So without further ado, uh, we're here to help and to listen. We have a lot going on this week. Uh, I've got a, we have a little open meeting tomorrow with uh, some other uh, hot potato issues uh, on the uh, agenda as well. So I've got to go work on those. But um, look forward to working with all of you. But uh, let's hurry up and get our work done. Thank you very much. Ah, well, I should introduce my colleague then. Let's see. Next, ah, Commissioner Clyburn, the chair, Chair Clyburn of the Joint Board, who I'm sure has many things to say on this topic. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, sir. Um, uh, you've said most of them, but thank you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'd like to join in the course in thanking the panelists for participating in today's workshop. I also would like to acknowledge the FCC uh, staff uh, for their diligence in planning this workshop. I know a great deal of advanced planning uh, must be done for these workshops to be successful, and I want to uh, formally thank uh, all of you who played a role. I would not uh, feel comfortable this morning if I did not also uh, thank Commissioner Copps. He recommended uh, that the agency conduct workshops on universal service and intercarrier compensation uh, reform to encourage a di dialogue and consensus building. And again, I would like to thank you uh, for that. I wholeheartedly agree with him. I agree with him a lot of the time. But I wholeheartedly agree with him that these workshops have that potential in terms of consensus building. And it is my hope that today's inaugural workshop on these issues will do just that. These issues are of vital importance to ensuring that every American has access to both affordable voice and broadband service no matter where they live. And I look forward to the exchange today in order to get there. Thank you so very much. <laughs> the benefit of going last is that I do get to be brief, so I want to commend and associate myself with all the words of my esteemed colleagues and chairman. Um, I think having all five commissioners at a workshop, if it's not completely unprecedented, it's pretty close, it's definitely rare, and I think that fact alone is telling for how important this is. Um, so again, I won't repeat what you all have said. But I think we all hope that we have a chance here for real reform, and we're all extremely grateful that you're here. Reform needs to happen sooner rather than later. I really think that, to me, universal service, um, ICC reform, and spectrum reform are agenda items 1 and 1A on our to-do list for 2011, and I appreciate my colleagues' commitment to both of these things. Um, the approach that we take today, I think, to just say address these things head on and a number of the most vexing issues that have been before us um, is the right one. 
I, we have left a lot of these questions, such as phantom traffic, access stimulation, and uh, VoIP comp compensation. Just they, We've just left them to linger for way too long, and so I really appreciate the agenda today. I welcome our focus on these things first, and um, I'll be particularly interested uh, to hear the perspectives of how the IP-based services should be incorporated into a circuit-switched world in an efficient and equitable manner. And not to be left out this afternoon's panels, um, we're going to focus on an issue that has not received sufficient focus. What type of recovery re reform, revenue recovery mechanism is needed to offset the lost intercarrier compensation payments? And how to square any of the new mechanism with the need to control the size of the fund? There are so many issues to negotiate, but the fund size should not be one. We cannot afford to let the fund continue to grow and check. I again want to add my thanks to the Wireline Bureau for pulling together this event and I really thank today's panelists. Uh, having such an esteemed crowd here is really helpful. Um, I thank you for participating and, and hopefully working with all of us hand in hand as we work to find the compromises that are going to be necessary to place our universal service and intercarrier compensation regimes on firmer footing in an IP world. So um, good luck today. We are anxious to hear your thoughts, your expertise, and um, thanks again for being here. Good morning. I'm Al Lewis in the Pricing Policy Division of the Wireline Competition Bureau. Welcome. And thank you to our panelists for the first workshop through which the Commission will hear the perspectives of interested parties on the issues presented in the Universal Service and Intercarrier Compensation Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. We are eager to hear and learn from the perspectives of consumer representatives, state authorities, industry analysts, and industry participants. In our first of three sessions today, we will focus on arbitrage activities that are occurring in the market as a result of the current intercarrier compensation system. In particular, our panelists have been invited to comment on proposals to address phantom traffic, the delivery of calls with insufficient information to identify who delivered the call or where it came from, and access stimulation, arrangements between local exchange carriers and providers of high volume services designed to radically increase the number of incoming calls and intercarrier compensation revenues. <clears throat> our first session is scheduled for an hour and 15 minutes, so I will quickly introduce our panelists. Each panelist will then summarize their pos positions or proposals in three minutes or less, and we will turn to questions from the audience in person and online <clears throat> and our expert questioners to engage our panel in what I'm sure will be a lively discussion. If members of the audience would like to submit questions for the panel, we have note cards available <coughs> from our staff. <coughs> so just write your questions on the cards and the staff will bring them up to, to the panel. For our online audience members, you can email questions to iccreform at fcc.gov. Our panelists this morning from left to right, Iowa Utilities Board Member Krista Tanner, <coughs> Melissa Newman, Vice President, Federal Regulatory Affairs, CenturyLink, David Erickson, founder of FreeConferenceCall.com, David Frankel, the founder of ZipDX, Michael Romano, Senior Vice President of Policy, National Telecommunications Cooperative Association. Jonathan Banks, Senior Vice President, Law and Policy, U.S. Telecom. And Dave Shornack, Director of Business Development for Techstar Communications. Thank you. And Krista, if you'd like to get us started. Is that, okay, there we go. Well, thank you. And, and first of all, I'd like to thank the FCC for inviting me to participate today. And not only for my invitation today, um, but it has not gone unnoticed among the states how inclusive this FCC uh, commission has been uh, and has invited the, the states to, to participate in these dialogues every step of the way, and, and that is very much appreciated. 
Uh, as the notice of proposed rulemaking noted, the Iowa Utilities Board has taken steps to address traffic pumping in Iowa. Last year, the IUB issued rules governing the intrastate access charges that may be assessed by carriers engaging in what the IUB has termed high volume access services. These rules were, uh, or the IUB an announced its intent to create these rules at the conclusion of a contested case uh, that involved a formal complaint filed by Quest against eight Iowa LECs who were engaged in traffic pumping activities via agreements with conference calling companies. The board ultimately found that the traffic associated with the conference calling companies was not subject to the LEC switch access tariffs. The conclusion was based upon the findings that the companies were not end users under the tariffs. Assuming they were end users, the traffic was not delivered to an end user premises as required by the LEX tariffs. And in the case of six of the respondent LEX, the traffic did not even terminate in the LEX exchange as is necessary for a LEX tariff to apply. Based on these findings, uh, the IUB uh, ordered that the charges were inappropriate and ordered uh, refunds of the access charges. But because the IUB's findings were based largely on tariff violations, the IUB was concerned that in the future, LUX could enter into revenue sharing agreements with free conference calling companies in a way that, um, that conformed to their tariffs uh, and then would continue on with these arbitrage activities. So to curb these future arbitrage abuses, the IUB initiated a rulemaking to address the intrastate access rates associated with high volume traffic in those areas where access rates have been set high to reflow tra low traffic volumes. The approach that we took in our rules was based on the argument made by the LEX that Quest complaint was really about rates. That is how much the IXC has to pay for terminating toll traffic as the volumes of that traffic increase. So based on these arguments, the board initiated the, the high volume access rules uh, on which the FCC has sought comment uh, as an alternative to its proposed rules. So I've just given you a, a very brief overview of how those rules came to be. Um, and I would be happy throughout this workshop to answer more detailed questions regarding those rules. And with that, I'll end my comments. And again, thank you for inviting me. Is this on? Okay. Um, I am pleased to be here today, and I applaud the FCC for teeing up phantom traffic and access stimulation issues in the MPRM and for adopting an expedited common cycle. I'm also pleased to announce that this is my first public appearance uh, since CenturyLink and Quest merged last Friday, hence the green scarf. Um, the combined company CenturyLink operates in 37 states. Uh, CenturyLink is the third largest phone company in the country, and notably 74% of CenturyLink's service territory is in low density, high cost areas with fewer than 30 people per square mile. The common theme for this panel is gaming taking advantage of the rules, or lack thereof, to manipulate the system to make windfall profits. I'll first talk about phantom traffic. The NPRM rightly describes phantom traffic as improper arbitrage. Carriers disguise the nature or source of the traffic in order to avoid or reduce their access payments. Phantom traffic is not inadvertent loss of identifying information. It's deliberate cheating by a carrier intentionally evading compliance with the FCC's intercarrier compensation rules. It undermines the foundation of universal service and it distorts competition. The NPRM's proposed rules are a great starting point. They would prohibit altering, stripping, or omitting calling number information. CenturyLink has long supported US Telecom's interim proposal. It is straightforward. Originating carriers must transmit identifying information and intermediate carriers must pass that information on. CenturyLink believes the FCC should go even further and state that the principle of the T-Mobile decision should apply so that ILEX can invoke the negotiation processes if other carriers refuse to enter into agreements with us. Turning to traffic pumping, it is an unlawful scheme to arbitrage switched access rates that were designed for rural, low volume areas. It results in carriers being billed tens of millions of dollars, all to provide windfall profits to high volume free conference call and chat services 
um, with their LAC, CLAC partners. CenturyLink has for a long time urged the FCC to end this abuse. The NPRM proposes to do so using a hybrid approach and we applaud that approach. CenturyLink has some additional measures we would take, but the approach in the NPRM is a great starting point. Um, in addition, we also think the FCC should confirm that tariffs filed or maintained to start or continue this unlawful practice violate the Communications Act and should not get Section 204 protection. A tariff that was deliberately unlawful when filed can't be then deemed lawful. We really appreciate the FCC inviting CenturyLink to be on this panel. We're very interested in working with the industry and the FCC to stop these practices. Thank you. I'm Dave Erickson with Free Conferencing Corporation. Um, I really appreciate being here and I thank all of you for, for uh, coming. Um, what we do is we do toll conferencing. Um, historically, uh, terminating access has been paid on toll conferencing. What we did different is we took the organizer fees out of toll conferencing. <clears throat> Our average user uses 28 minutes per month per year. That's, that's all the minutes they use. It's not an abusive practice in the form of, of minutes. The average call size is five people. Toll conferencing in its nature, right, reduces the amount of long distance that a person uses. If you don't believe me, cancel your next conference call and try doing it person to person and see how much long distance you use. We operate in the Americas, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia and in Australia with the same business model. <clears throat> Domestically, we are in both rural and urban areas. We have nine locations in rural areas, seven in urban areas. Of the nine in rural areas, four operate with a high volume access tariff that reduces the tariff as volume goes up. All of the nine have direct relationships or direct connections to the wholesale marketplace. Some of the companies opposed uh, to what we do are, are engaged in, in, in price wars in the wholesale marketplace, meaning if uh, we unload the, the, the traffic, they try and take it back by lowering their price. Um, I feel that toll conferencing is not the problem. Presidential campaigns use it, Congress uses it, the Senate uses it. Revenue sharing is not the problem but I feel that pricing is the problem, and I want to work towards a pricing solution for a pricing problem. <clears throat> I like the idea of the revenue sharing trigger. I don't like the idea of a revenue sharing ban. I think that if a revenue sharing trigger triggers something like a high volume access tariff, it'll do two things. One, it'll protect the rural uh, uh, lex that revenue share but don't stimulate access. And the ones that do stimulate access, it will reduce their tariff uh, to a level playing field with, with the urban areas. Um, by doing it that way, you'll incentivize investment in the rural areas, uh, create infrastructure, and create jobs in the areas where we need it, need it the most. Um, I believe that we can arrive at a pricing solution that we could have a deemed lawful status. And I feel it's necessary to have that kind of certainty and that kind of predictability for investment in those areas as well as in, in, in urban areas. So I um, completely support this effort and look forward to working with all of you to find a solution. Good morning. My name is David Frankel. My business is ZipDX LLC. We are a conferencing provider. Uh, we today do not operate in a mode that, uh, that, that uses ICC to our advantage. We pay interstate uh, compensation charges as part of our wholesale arrangements with our underlying service providers. I've been involved in these proceedings uh, for several years. There are, there are many that I've met uh, who have come before me, and I'm delighted that, uh, that the FCC is now committed to taking action to, to resolve this. Um, as we've heard many times, the ICC as an element of supporting uh, and subsidizing uh, rural subscribers uh, is broken and there's a commitment now to fixing it. Uh, this particular endeavor is about some interim adjustments uh, while we undertake longer term overall reform. 
and, and I'm delighted to see that this is happening. If I thought I could come here today and ask you to codify a, 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 a regime that would help my conferencing business and, and, and give me particular benefits, I would ask you for that. But what I've seen in, in the proceedings to date and in your previous actions and in the National Broadband Plan is that you're not going to do that. You've already decided that that's not the role that ICC plays. Even though there are certain benefits that we could probably bring, uh, I'm, I'm a clever engineer, I can come up with things that we can do, you've said you're not going to do that. So the question now is, what are you going to do to help ICC hang on and do what it is, what, what it is supposed to do while you reform the overall program? And certainly, phantom traffic and access stimulation are, are big pieces that today are being exploited and, and diverting ICC from that primary mission. So, so I think that what's been proposed is absolutely necessary, needs to be undertaken quickly. I think that when I look under the covers as an engineer at what's going on, you know, what I see is what I call most cost routing. As an engineer, I just think this is ridiculous. But what you see is you see people locating in, in, in locations that are particularly expensive with respect to ICC where they're going to drive a lot of traffic. If you were an engineer, of course you'd go to a lowest cost location if you were going to drive a lot of traffic. That would be the most efficient. Uh, you would not insert extra elements into your call path just so that you could collect addis additional compensation. Okay, that doesn't make any engineering sense. It doesn't serve the public good. So I think as part of this interim action, the FCC should not only do what's already been explicitly proposed, but consider some further steps to, to explicitly say, we're not going to permit this kind of gaming. It's not appropriate. The patient is, is, is dying here. And while we try to let it live long enough to let us transition to something you know, more reasonable, let's not uh, uh, completely crush it with these additional endeavors. My name is Mike Romano. I'm the Senior Vice President of Policy for the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association. Just want to say thank you to the commissioners and their legal advisors and the Bureau staff for uh, allowing us to participate today. Uh, turning first to phantom traffic, um, the question of phantom traffic, uh, the practice, it, it complicates or completely obfuscates the answers to three fundamental questions. Um, which provider is responsible for the call? What payment is due for the call? And what happens if someone doesn't comply with the rules? Uh, agreeing with CenturyLink, the notice of proposed rulemaking um, proposals represent a great starting point uh, for, for, for addressing phantom traffic. But I think they only address that middle question, that second question, which is what payment is due for the call. Um, you know, passing the CPN or charge number without stripping or alteration is, is, is great. Uh, making sure that gets across all of the indirect networks and platforms, uh, very good start as well. Um, but to answer all three questions, you've got to make sure that more information gets in and stays in the uh, signaling information and or the billing records that follow. Uh, in particular, to answer the first question about which provider is responsible for the call, you need to be uh, able to tell whom to bill. And uh, CPN or CN don't necessarily answer that question. You're going to need to uh, therefore get the uh, carrier identification code or the KIC or the OCN, the operating company number, which appears in the billing records, and uh, probably also the jurisdictional information parameter, or the JIP or LRN, that uh, can appear in the signaling or in the billing records. Those are the tools that are really needed to answer that first question. And, and, and frankly, you know, as people say sometimes, well, phantom traffic doesn't become an issue if unified rates are, are put into place. That's not true either. You could still have someone not tell you who's sending the call to you. And so having the kick and the OCN and the JIP and the LRN are really important, even in a unified rate environment, to identify who is responsible for the call in question. So, so the rules really do need to go beyond the, the starting point in the NPRM and address these additional um, requirements. You also need to address a few other pieces of this relating to the substitution of CPN or charge numbers, um, how to identify uh, the jurisdiction of a call based upon the CPN or the charge number, and then also the violation of the rules. What happens? It's hard to say to someone, you need to go back and file a formal complaint against this. You need to have some deterrent built into the rules to, to um, affect, uh, affect behavior. On access stimulation, um, NTCA came out this, uh, this winter and supported the U.S. Telecom proposal that was filed with a number of other carriers. I think the X was on that as well. And um, we support that by and large. The, I'd say the most significant 
question or concern we had was the uh, impact of revenue sharing trigger in that because there are legitimate arrangements involving cooperatives, for example, and the no supposed rulemaking recognized this, that could be swept up in a revenue sharing trigger or prohibition. We think it would be better to impose a, a minute of use trigger that would, um, uh, that would ad address this more precisely and yet sweep up uh, any incentives to, uh, to stimulate traffic, uh, access traffic. So. Great, thanks. Uh, I wanted to thank the chairman, the commissioners, and the staff for their focus on these issues, particularly the. Where do you turn it off? Should kick on once you start speaking. How's it? Okay. So I wanted to thank the uh, chairman, commissioners, and the staff for f their focus on on intercarrier comp issues, and particularly these arbitrage issues, and for having the workshops. Exploiting loopholes in the regulatory access system is a serious problem that siphons money away from communications consumers and communications networks. It raises the cost of communication services and creates complexity in litigation for, for our companies that involves the federal government, states, courts, um, and is a, a real drag on, on investment in communication networks and serving communications consumers. Phantom traffic and access stimulation are, are the two key arbitrage issues, that, and, and um, it's great that this panel is addressing them. Phantom traffic is an issue that springs from the need for billing information so that calls that traverse a communications network can be billed correctly. Our concern is that carrier or that service providers have been deliberately not providing that information or stripping it as it moves across communications networks and that the Commission's rules don't sufficiently address all the service providers that originate calls and transport them. The FCC in the recent NPRMs proposes rules that go, that would require service providers to provide the information necessary for billing and to ensure that that gets transmitted across networks as calls flow. We think the FCC's proposed rules go to the heart of the phantom traffic problem by requiring all service providers to provide calling party information and intermediate carriers to transmit that information so that the information flows through to the carrier at the end of the call that can then bill for the services. U.S. Telecom has spent years working on this and has developed a broad consensus proposal on phantom traffic. It has additional safeguards built into it that we urge the staff and the commissioners to consider. In addition, the proposed rules, in our view, require some narrow technical modifications. However, they take aim at the very heart of the phantom traffic problem, and we wholeheartedly support their implementation immediately to solve or to help solve this problem. And let me just say that the phantom traffic and access stimulation solutions need to be implemented now. They would provide better information to all of us on the types and kinds of traffic traversing our networks. They would preserve the integrity of the FCC's access scheme. And arguments that continued delay in implementing these narrow targeted solutions, that continued delay is essential to comprehensive reform, have not proven out over the last several years. Not solving these issues does not help do comprehensive re reform. These are discrete issues that solving them would build momentum for reform. And in terms of our membership, which spans the smallest carriers to the largest, solving these problems will not reduce our members' incentives to engage in comprehensive reform, which is a much bigger and more pressing problem. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Dave Shornack. I'm the Director of Business uh, Development and Sales for Arvik Enterprises, uh, the parent company of Techstar. I'm here with my local Minnesota Consul, Dan Lipschultz. I want to thank the SEC for inviting us to appear before today's workshop. And I would like to make four points in my remarks. First, addressing concerns about access stimulation requires one action by the Commission. Adoption of rules ensuring just and reasonable rates as access traffic volumes increase substantially. Second, a market has developed to address compensation for the termination of tra high traffic volumes by rural CLEX. The resulting compensation agreements provide the best foundation upon which the Commission should base any rules. 
Third, the Commission's proposed solution is appropriate, is appropriate because it reflects these market agreements and the Commission's current SELEC benchmarking rules, reduces uncertainty, and based upon our extensive experience, is enforceable. Finally, the Commission should make clear that if a rural SELEC that has entered into revenue sharing agreements has modified its tariff as required by the new rule, a termination of toll traffic on the SELEX network for an IXC, uh, IXC is exchange access service provided to that IXC and that SELEX should receive payment as set forth in the new rule. I believe I can speak for everyone in saying that we all wish that to avoid any new rounds of litigation, period. Background on Techstar. Techstar is a facility-based rural SELEC operating in Minnesota since 1997. We provide telecommunications, internet, and voice services to approximately 15,000 residential and business customers, of which approximately a dozen are call conferencing entities. As a rural SELEC, Techstar is entitled under the Commission's rules to assess interstate switch access charges at the NECA band eight rates, currently over 3.6 cents per minute of use because it competes with a non-rural ILEC. Even though it is permitted to charge at the NECA band 8 local switching rate, Texar has market agreements for over three years with many IXCs at rates substantially below the benchmark rate Texar is entitled to charge as a rural CLEC. These agreements now cover approximately 80% of the interstate switch access services Texar provides. Last year, Texar filed a new interstate tariff that reflects its market experience in its market agreements. At the lowest volume band, Techstar's marginal rates are now 50% of the rate Techstar is entitled to charge under the NECA band under the current rules. In the highest band, the marginal rates are approximately 10% of what is entitled to charge. Techstar agreements are largely the result of three factors. First, both IXCs and rural CLEX have incentives to settle disputes. Secondly, the Commission's decision since 2007 have provided important directions to IXCs and rural CLEX about their rights, about their rights and obligations. Finally, IXCs refuse to pay tariff rates when they suspect there is access simulation. As a result, a market has developed to address compensation for the termination of high traffic volumes of IXC traffic by CLEX. In essence, today, any rural CLEX engaged in determining high volumes of inter-exchange traffic for its customers and for the IXC's customers who place the calls that wants to receive payment from an IXC for the carriage of the toll calls traffic on their network has to enter into an agreement with the IXC at reduced rates, close to what is being proposed by the Commission. So we believe that the Commission is on target in what they're doing. Thank you for your time. Thank you again very much for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. We'll now open it up for questions and again, Anyone here in the room, if you have a question, there are note cards available from staff. Please uh, flag one of them down, write down your question, and they'll bring it up here to the panel. If you're online, the email address is iccreform at fcc.gov. So commissioners or commissioner staff, would you, would you like to start off our questioning? Well, I know that Randy has a question. <laughs> I, I certainly do. What a great day. Everybody's here thinking about phantom traffic and access stimulation. <laughs> Let's take advantage of it and jump right in um, with some thoughts about phantom traffic. Um, as you all know, our, our, our notice uh, proposed to require telecommunications providers and interconnected VoIP service providers to transmit calling party telephone number to the next provider in the call path. Um, and some of you mentioned uh, our proposed rules uh, in, in your statements. Um, I want to dig just a little bit deeper uh, as to whether or not you think those proposed rules are an effective solution going forward. Um, if not, what would be the most effective uh, forward-looking solution? Um, and if we get into another solution, particularly, uh, Mike, you started it. <laughs> if we get into OCNs and JIPs and kicks and, and all of that good stuff, um, how do we draw the line? between necessary commission rules and effective industry standards. Um, I guess since I called you out, feel free to take the first crack at it, but I'm interested to hear what anybody, what, what all of our panelists have to say. 
premise of uh, those fundamental questions you're trying to answer. Um, it, it, you really do come back to CPN and CN uh, you know, tell you who placed the call and potentially the jurisdiction of the caller, although that's not always the case either. Certainly though, um, you know, regardless of what the rate is, we're going to end up in a situation where I may not know who to bill in an environment where the number's been ported or there are other complications associated with, you know, intermediate gateways and things of that sort. So I think, you know, the, the, the touchstone needs to be what is necessary for someone to, for, for a, a carrier to figure out who to bill regardless of whether the rate is access or dot triple oh seven. Um, and, and so those acronyms I threw out are some of those that I think th the industry has previously identified as allowing, enabling a terminating provider to figure out who the responsible originating provider is. Um, and, and, and so passing those through would seem to be an essential foundation. Beyond that, I, I think you can certainly leave it open to industry uh, discussion as to what other fields might serve that purpose or whether one or more of those fields are the right way to go. But you have to have something there to answer that first fundamental question of, who do I look to? Because frankly, if I don't know who to look to, I probably have to look to the last carrier who handed it to me in line. And I know that that's a concern for, for some uh, in the industry, but it's sort of like the check clearing process. If, if I only know the last person who handed it to me, I have to look to them because they're in a better position uh, to look upstream and figure out where that call came from and to enforce against that provider in turn, sort of like an indemnification regime. So I, I think that's where I would start to draw the line. Can I just... Uh maybe counter that a little bit. I, I would discourage you from, from adding more requirements and regulations that, that force the industry to go back, modify systems, and so on. Th this is an antiquated, ridiculous regime anyway. Uh, these days, nobody in the big picture, certainly end users, don't care whether it's a local, an intra-MTA, an interstate, an intrastate call. Propagating that further now isn't helping consumers. We don't care. Okay, this is an industry internal problem, and, and it's a legacy problem. If you look at how the internet works today, and it works great, nobody cares. You don't know where the server is. You don't know if it's an in-state uh, IP connection that you've got. In fact, you're, when you bring up a web window, it's pulling information from all over the world, probably, and it works great. And if we tried to impose the legacy rules that we have in telecom on the internet, and you had to pay a millicent to Google for sourcing an ad from Mountain View, and so much money to somebody else for pulling data from their server in Idaho, you know, we go crazy. So don't put more of this rubbish on top of poor old telecom that's still, you know, struggling to remain relevant. You, you absolutely should look upstream. If you got the traffic from XYZ IXE, look to them for, for where you go with your bill. Don't ask the, the government to impose additional regulations and have the industry add additional fields so that that can sort of all be backwards engineered. I think that, that absolutely the mechanisms for now, given that we're stuck with it, you have to force carriers to, to put in legitimate CPN and CN and to not mess with it along the way. And that's what your rules say. But if you can't figure out what the jurisdiction of the call is, then use factoring. And by the way, look at wireless. You know, the, the telecom world today is dominated by wireless. There's twice as many wireless subscriptions as there are wireline. And that's wireline Arbach, wireline Ruralec, wireline VoIP. Add all those together, it's still half of wireless. And wireless people are roaming. We don't know what their jurisdiction is. And, you know, the world gets along okay. And by the way, Wireline doesn't collect access charges. They can't tariff them. Th they get along okay. So let's look at a less regulation and, and less requirements and simplify the stuff, get the states on board with conforming rates so that we don't have to worry about all the minutia that where the billing actually costs more than the carriage of the call. John? just jump in a little bit and um, just to be clear we're only talking about rules for the PSTN network we're not talking about this on the internet and I think Mike raises some really good points about OCNs and all this but having spent years working on this and developing these consensus proposals and and we have some extra things we might want in here for way too long we've let the perfect be the enemy of the good when it comes to a phantom traffic solution and from our perspective, the thing to do is to implement something that will substantially help with the problem, 
the commission's proposed rules would do that. I do think they need a little, some technical modifications to harmonize the feasibility and standard setting exceptions. Those are narrow and technical. However, the rules themselves would make a substantial step forward and one that we should have taken years ago and one that would have benefited us all substantially. I think we need to implement those. We need to pay attention to some of the extra issues we've raised or Mike ish has raised over time. But getting this done now in the right way would make a big difference, and the Commission's rules are a huge step forward. Uh, one thing, um, one thing um, I would like to add is, um, you know, maybe to deal with some of these issues, especially with indirect interconnection, where, you know, some CLEX or uh, carriers um, refuse to enter into an agreement, is you can figure this out if you actually have an agreement. And if the principle of the T-Mobile decision could apply in this case here to carriers or CLEX who do not enter into agreements and let us use that process which already exists to be able to establish agreements we would be able to think I think figure out all these issues because you'd be dealing directly in an agreement context with them. Mike, do you want to yeah, if I might just respond briefly um, you know the problem here is I think we've got a little bit of a whipsaw I mean David says, on the one hand, I should look to the carrier who just handed the call off to me. But on the other hand, under the current rules, I can't look to the caller who, or the carrier who just handed the call off to me as a terminating carrier because I'm supposed to look to who the you know, carrier is that's responsible. Transit, right now, there's been a lot of debate in the industry over whether a transit provider, the tandem provider, should be responsible for terminating compensation and then a turnaround upstream. So while David's solution sounds good in theory, the fact is the rules don't work that way right now. So I really do need to know who the carrier is who's financially responsible for that call to pay me for it, or through the kind of information I talked about, or in the alternative, impose a regime along the lines of what David just said. But you know, you've got large carriers who perform very significant tandem functions who oppose that kind of a regime. So it's a bit of a whipsaw to, to say we got to move away from that without changing otherwise the compensation structure. Melissa is proposing is a solution to that problem. It, you know, the Commission's rules are clear that the originating carrier is responsible. The issue for all of our, for our smaller members like Mike's is that oftentimes they get traffic through a tandem or an intermediate carrier and they don't have a contract or a billing relationship with a CLEC that originated the call. Under the Commission's rules, CLEX can make ILEX negotiate, but ILEX can't make CLEX negotiate. So our smaller members, when they approach CLEX, often don't get anywhere in terms of negotiating a contract that would provide for billing. If we did have the, an exception to the T-Mobile doctrine and applied that so that small ILEX could essentially force CLEX to sit down at the negotiating table, they could not force a result, but they could force a good faith bargaining then the smaller ILEX could come up with some sort of billing arrangement with the, the distant CLEC and with the pr Commission's proposed phantom traffic rules would have enough information to start the bargaining process. So that seemed to us after rounds and rounds of industry negotiations to be the sensible approach to this rather than trying to make somebody the banker who goes back to someone else who goes back to someone else. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from one of our uh, WebEx online participants, and thank you, thank you for your question. Um, the question is, does phantom traffic have to originate on the PSTN? No, phantom traffic can and does originate anywhere. Um, the Commission's rules now require that most PSTN calls have this information. I think the rules may technically not apply to service providers that are IP originating calls. However, so phantom traffic can originate in a lot of different places. Some phantom traffic originates because of technical issues with certain older switches or transit arrangements or 800 number calling, but there is a substantial amount of phantom traffic that originates on the IP side. A and in fact, I would argue that that phantom traffic is interwoven with the VoIP ICC problem because in fact a lot of IP originated traffic on on purpose is labeled such that it 
it arbitrages or games the ICC system. You can see that in the calling patterns and calling data. And I didn't plant a plug for our second panel, but we'll, we, we will be addressing those issues. Can you help us to quantify the size of the phantom traffic problem? And relatedly, how has the phantom traffic issue changed in the last couple of years with the rise of VoIP traffic? I don't have any firsthand data um, on behalf of the collected you know, membership of NTCA, but I, I know that um, one example, I think Frontier's done a pretty good job of trying to assess this, and it would urge people to look at their comments. They've done a pretty good uh, snapshot test case. I think when I saw their comments that were filed the other day, they had, um, I, I want to say it was 70,000 minutes a day or something, or I can't remember exactly what the number was, but terminating to a certain, uh, originating from what may have been a few numbers or lines. So um, uh, there, are, there are carriers who've done a study uh, of the magnitude of the problem. Um, smaller carriers, I think, have not necessarily gone back and tried to snapshot it, but I, I, I have also heard somewhere that it's roughly 6 to 8 percent, I think, of traffic uh, so based upon some studies from a few years ago. When we did a survey of our members, um, we came up with higher numbers, you know, over 10 percent for the amount of traffic that arrives without all the information. However, some of that is legitimately arriving without all the information because it's 800 number calling or whatever. So I think the 5 to 8 percent is a pretty legitimate estimate of the amount of phantom traffic that results from potentially deliberately stripping the information or not providing it. Well, we have a couple of questions from the uh, audience here in the meeting room, and they apparently would like to uh, focus on access stimulation solutions. So the first question is, why not let IXCs pass terminating access rates onto originating toll callers and let those originating callers choose to call a free conference bridge or not? Isn't that a workable market solution to traffic pumping? Uh, I, I believe that's what's, what's happening, right? As, as a telecom consumer, I'm paying a telephone bill. I'm paying on some of my plans per minute. Some of them are unlimited long distance. But I'm basically paying my long distance company to connect, you know, connect my calls. Um, the thing here, right, is that we can't differentiate uh, different types of, of, say, toll conferencing, for example. When AT&T does toll conferencing uh, in Atlanta, uh, everyone pays their access there, right? The access gets paid. It's a non-geographical application, and so it could be hosted anywhere. Um, why not host it in rural areas and drive some of the revenues out there? So the consumer is paying for termination of the calls. That's what I believe the, the consumer pays for. If it's not to terminate, if it's not to connect the call, what are they paying for? I think the what your the audience uh, members question is, is is driving back revokes in my mind uh, 900 and 976 calling, where where it's a premium based service and the caller would would pay an extra charge and know that they're paying an extra charge. And that's the trick here, is how are callers supposed to know that they're going to pay a premium to, to get this premium service at the other end? And, and we do have 900 numbers and we have 976 numbers and they don't work very well and they sort of got into disuse because customers found that very frustrating environment and, and carriers found it very frustrating because they were serving as the, the billers for that. And I think that, that what does serve consumers today in our country is we do have flat-rated calling, essentially, to, to the entire land. And people like that, and they like the simplicity of that. And so the dilemma, to answer the, the question, with passing that back through specifically at differentiated rates is that end users really have a very good, difficult time with that. Businesses and others that allow people to, to use their telephones have a difficult time policing that. It, become, it puts all the burden on the end user community and they're not prepared to deal with it. I'd, I'd like to add one more, more thought to that. And would we do the same with voicemail? Um, voicemail's an application. If the, the voicemail's not there, the, the access doesn't get stimulated. If the voicemail's there, then it answers and picks up and they can leave a message. And then access is stimulated, right? <laughs> 
Um, this is an, an, a normal calling procedure, right? The, the, the idea that somehow it becomes different um, is, is just, I don't, I don't know where we get there with that, right? It's a, it's a telephone call. We're making a telephone call. There's access on every telephone call. And there, there is. It's just not differentiated. I mean, the differential in the access charges, I think, what's often disputed here. Right. And, and voicemail is incidental to regular telephone service. And so it, 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 um, unless people are running pure voicemail only services, it, it's not really analogous. Um, so the question is when you have a service that is very specifically a, a mechanized termination, um, you know, it, is, that, is, is it appropriate to have a differential access charge apply in that situation? Or in fact, should the opposite be true? And should the access charge be either comparable or, or even less? than in a traditional call termination. Well, we actually got a follow-up call. Oh, uh, please. No. <laughs> um, so it's on. Is it on? Okay. Um, you know, as one of the, the panel said, it would require you to actually identify this traffic as 900 numbers. And what we found in the IUB proceeding is that part of the problem is this traffic is not accurately labeled. For example, adult contact, that content, that should be labeled with a 900 number. There are federal rules in place that say um, this traffic needs to be identified. Carriers need to take action to prohibit this content from reaching children. That's not happening. So if you take this approach by identifying the traffic with a 900 number, we're going to create rules to to chase down another symptom of, of this problem, and I don't think you're going to get to the root of the problem, which is which is that you are allowing carriers to receive the higher access rates that were always meant for for low levels of use. And so, um, I, I I I think that would be very difficult to um, to actually regulate. You know, I I. I I went in, into the um, into the legalities of my opening statements about we found this on they found these violated the tariffs. But what the IUB proceeding showed was a myriad of ways that folks have gamed this system, and I don't and it's hard for us to keep track of it. So I think the best way is just to solve the problem at the source of the issue and not try to figure out what content is what and assigning value to content as as mr erickson said you know why we don't regulate content why does this phone call cost more than another simply based on content that is something that we want nothing to do with at the state commissions i think the uh, fcc is on target with their whole concept of if you have a revenue sharing agreement in place maybe that's the trigger and we've worked through market agreements with many of the ixcs reducing our rates really basically down to, uh, in some of our agreements, close to the Arbok rates. And so I think it is working out there. Um, and it's, we're not monitors or, or judges of the traffic. The only comment I guess we have about revenue sharing, it made a brief mention of this with time permitted in the opening statement, uh, but is the concern that it could sweep up overly, it, it could be overly broad and sweep up legitimate arrangements. Um, you know, in the smaller areas, you've got telcos that have five employees. They're not large companies, and potentially they may be buying more in wholesale long distance service than they are charging in access. And so that is that kind of an arrangement, revenue sharing? I, I don't think so. That's the intent. But uh, the, the, the ability to comply with that kind of requirement um, post hoc, it, it's hard to do because you don't know what exactly falls within the scope of a revenue sharing arrangement. Likewise, um, cooperatives, when they uh, I issue credits to members, is that is that a revenue sharing arrangement? Um, if they pay the electric utility more for electrical service than they receive in uh, income from that uh, or service payments from that utility in the in the same area, the cooper electric cooperative in that area. Those are just some examples. And, and again, I don't think any of them are intended to be swept up by it, but there's a concern that they could be. One thing we liked um, in the U.S. Telecom proposal from October, or I say U.S. Telecom, but they filed it. It was a coalition of, of, of groups who were in, on that. Um, they they, they uh, had a minutes of use trigger, and I think that actually is uh, of interest because it gets to the heart of the economics of the issue. I mean, you could have a case in which there's a stimulation of access that isn't shared with anyone. 
is just accrues to the benefit of the provider who stimulated the access traffic. Um, and so having a minute of use trigger would get to those types of volume stimulation uh, exercises as well, while not potentially sweeping up unin uh, unintentionally um, other arrangements that are legitimate. <coughs> that you couldn't have a revenue sharing arrangement. It's just once you had one, there would then be changes in rates. So it's not saying that they can't exist. Um, and that's why I think the trigger is actually a good one. You're not saying it's per se unlawful, but you are making changes then in the rates uh, to go from there. Um, and, and I'm not sure I see a problem with that because you would still be able to take on legitimate revenue sharing opportunities. Well, that's that's true, but I might only have 10 minutes of traffic and my rate has suddenly been shot downward and I've got no high volume of traffic. So you've got a case in which you're in a, you're artificially driving down the rate without any tether to whether there's actually been a high volume of traffic or not. This is this is the reason why we believe that it has to be a, a, a two stage test. Um, the first would be revenue sharing triggers a high volume access tariff and then volume triggers the lowering of the rate. And with those two tests in place, you protect the company he's talking about that only has 10 minutes. They file a high volume access tariff. They're required to, to refile, but it doesn't affect their rate because they don't have the high amounts of, of access to, to trigger the, the lowering of the rate. And, and the company that does stimulate access, right, basically starts heading towards the Arbok raid or the largest ILEC in the state. But the thing you want to remember is you want to keep it simple. You don't want to have it burdensome and we'd be all here again arguing over the rules and so I think the key is to try to keep it simple, not make it burdensome on all of us to uh, be able to fulfill the rules. Here's the interesting thing about this issue on access stimulation. There's agreement on this panel to do something to change the rates, it may be, I, I'm fine with a trigger that's minute of, of use, actually. Um, but the surprise to me on this panel, which I hope is some comfort to the FCC, is you have really a cross-section of folks on this panel saying, you can do something here on access stimulation. And I hope that point does not get lost. There seems to be broad agreement up here on that point. Just a uh, follow-up question from the audience here on revenue sharing. Is the real issue not revenue sharing, but sharing that results in payment to the customer? So in our comments, we have tried to come up with some alternate wording, I think, to address your concern. And that is that uh, the, the point is that if as a, as a particular customer or partner uses more traffic, if that results in the net obligation of that customer towards the carrier going down, including in aggregate, not per minute, but, but in aggregate going down. In other words, the more they use, the, the less their bill is, or in fact, it may get to the point that the carrier is now obligated to pay them. But if, if that's the structure of the agreement, then that's an indication that they are getting an excess a return from any inter intercarrier compensation to the point that they are able to allow their their customer to pay less or, or to even earn money from them and so for your example of the, the power company I mean you don't have any legitimate customers where they pay a power bill and also as the power company makes more phone calls or receives more phone calls they pay less to to your carrier so just to so it, it's not a net, you're, what you're talking about is not a net payment measurement necessarily. It's, it's literally that their, their bill goes down as the usage of that customer increases. So it's right. not the case if a telco uh, cooperative in a rural area happens to be paying more for its power usage to right. the electric co-op than, than the electric co-op is buying in telecom services. You're saying That's that exactly kind of rule would not be swept up. I mean, that, right. that, that could be something that could work together. I, I do think, though, that... Um, it still, frankly, may not sweep up um, the cases in which you've got uh, high volumes of traffic that aren't necessarily shared. But well, that's, that's yeah. the difficulty: yeah. is how yeah. do you how do you impute such agreements when you have 
under one umbrella uh, uh, an enhanced provider or an enhanced service being delivered and, and there is no explicit agreement. So then you have to impute an agreement and that obviously gets trickier. Yeah, from our perspective working on this, it, there, is a, there is a certain simplicity to the minutes of use measurements because they're relatively more public than revenue sharing or access sharing agreements. But, but again, to kind of echo what Melissa was saying, this is something where there's a lot of agreement that there's a problem. There's a lot of agreement that we, there are sensible steps we can take soon that would preserve a lot of money that's flowing out from communications consumers and networks and focus that money on investing in broadband. And again, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and, and take some steps to solve this soon. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The IUB was <coughs> asked both in the contested case and, and in our rulemaking docket to make a finding that, um, that we would prohibit access sharing revenue agreements and we were hesitant to do that uh, we had a lot of the same questions that the FCC has noticed up you know how do you define it what if what if the luck itself is is conducting the activity um, and and so w we were we were worried about being overly broad and so instead what we found was similar the panelists have said is an access revenue sharing agreement can be evidence that your access rates are too high. And so that's why we adopted a, a minute of use type trigger. It is actually for an increase in your minutes of use. Um, but I have to say, I, I do like the CenturyLink proposal where they just have a set minute of use. I don't remember if that was proposed to us or not in, in our state rulemaking, but, um, but it's certainly much simpler than the IUB approach, which requires a trigger of a, an increase of 100% over six months. And there was a lot of testimony and, and evidence back and forth and if that's the right trigger. So um, I, I, I think it all comes down to the minutes of use and, and there are many ways to get there. I, I think that the minute of use per line, um, you know, people look to, to solve something in the rural areas with that, but that doesn't get used in, in, in the urban areas. And, like to try and keep the, the plain filled level. In, in Crow Creek, uh, we were able to work with the uh, Native American Indians there uh, who built a tribally owned phone company, um, did a revenue sharing uh, arrangement with us, uh, implemented a high volume access tariff, put it in front of the FCC on a 15 day. Um, it was approved and uh, we started working together. It's been a huge success, right? They have not tapped the government for a dime. They haven't done any USF or anything. And they have a tribally owned phone company. We did the same thing on Pine Ridge. And that's two, two phone companies on tribal lands in the last uh, couple of years. And there's under 10 to start with. So um, I think there's, there's a good way to solve the pricing problem with with a pricing solution. I think that revenue sharing is an indicator. Um, I think it's a good trigger, but I think it should have a high volume access tariff tied to it, bring it down to the Arbok rate, put everybody at a level playing field and distribute some of the minutes that we have that are being done in these big urban areas. They could be out in the rural areas at the same rates, same to the consumer, except supply and infrastructure, high tech jobs, uh, Native American phone companies, things like that. I agree with uh, what David had to say is that I think the revenue sharing model does work as a trigger. I think it becomes awful cumbersome when you start, uh, as we've seen the discussion occur here about the minutes of use. There's a lot of, that creates, I think, all kinds of other doubts and potential uh, issues with that. Uh, we recognize as a company, we have, as I mentioned in my comments, we've negotiated with other IXCs for lower rates that are fairly similar to the RBOX, and I think that model works. And uh, we realize that as the number of minutes uh, terminated uh, increase, that we should reduce our rates, and we have done that. And uh, um, I think that model works. I think it's simple, it's easy, it's uh, not as burdensome as some of the other proposals. I, one, one more thing I'd like to add. I, I think a high volume access tariff is also uh, easy to regulate. 
right? The, the, the carriers know what the tariff is and they know what their volumes are going to, to that, that local exchange carrier. Where when it's minutes of use on lines and things of that nature, how do we regulate that? How do we keep all that reported? How do we make the adjustments? When do we make the adjustments? What happens if people don't make the adjustments? Um, it's a little, little more difficult to police in my eyes. Just, just with reference to policing, I think that you know when we talk about referencing the RBOC rate, we throw that number out very casually. Um, I, I, if you go look at the tariffs, there are many, many, many elements that are included there. And going back to my most cost routing notion, um, you know, y y unfortunately, you, as someone mentioned, you, you poke this problem in one place and it pops up somewhere else. And I just think, uh, with respect to keeping rules simple. I mean, you make reference to, okay, it, the, the, it has to be benchmarked to the RBOC rate. It may be even simpler to simply specify what that, that rate is so that there isn't uh, all of these different elements and mileage and other things that get dreamed up uh, that then end up being disputes as well. So uh, I, we're all looking for, you know, as, as someone said, we don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. We want to try to come up with something that's fairly simple and straightforward. Um, I, I think whatever solution you come up with, it is not going to be consensus. You know, there are, there are people here on this panel that have fundamentally different positions about different aspects of this, so some of us are going to end up being disappointed in what you do. That there is no solution that will make everybody happy. You're going to have to go back to some basic principles and then make some hard decisions and say, this is the way it's going to be, and recognize, by the way, that these are essentially interim solutions until, by the way, we get the whole system reformed. Thank you very much. And just one logistical point. It was brought to my attention that if you pull the microphone closer to yourself before you start speaking, uh, it will work better. <coughs> For those of you who have uh, suggested a minutes of use trigger, could you help us understand your thoughts on how the commission could distinguish, I will say, legitimate increases in traffic volume, for example, Microsoft planting a new call center in the middle of Nebraska with high call volume increases due to access stimulation arrangements. Um, I pull it, then talk. There you go. Um, I think that's the beauty of it. You don't need to distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate traffic. I mean, I, and I don't, I don't think it matters. Uh, I don't, um, there was a, um, you know, I, I mentioned adult content before, and there was a lot of effort to get us pretty excited about that in, in the utilities board proceeding, and, and ultimately we were worried about it because of the identification issue. But we don't, we don't care what people are doing when they make phone calls. And um, it doesn't matter if you are in um, a bot calling territory and it's a conference center, or if you're in an RLEC territory and it's a, a conference, uh, or I'm, I'm sorry, like a, a call center. It doesn't matter. And so, um, and, and that's another reason why we went to this minutes of use trigger in Iowa, um, because we don't want to place a value on, on traffic and, and distinguish between what's legitimate or what's not. Nor do we care what you do with it. You know, there's a lot of talk about, well, we do great things with this money. Doesn't matter. As long as your rates are reasonable, doesn't matter what the traffic's for, doesn't matter do what you do with your reasonable profits. I, I think that the um, it should be a level playing field at the end of the day, urban to rural, if you're going to do high volume access. And I think if you do minutes of use, it's not a level playing field. So the idea is, is to create a level playing field and, and distribute the minutes. Um, it's going to make a healthier network than if it's all in the urban areas. I, I just, so I, this level playing field notion is, is one that I think Dave Frankel has, has really taken care of. I mean, a level playing field means you'd put things where the costs were lowest, and, and that's where no one would expect these things to go, which would tend to be in places where transport costs are low and, and there's lots of fiber. So that's what we would expect. And I do agree um, with Krista Tanner about this is really not about distinguishing le legitimate from illegitimate. It's just trying to keep access charges reflective of costs and volumes. So if somebody's volume doubles, and we have a proposal that 
is at a very high um, increase. If their volume goes way up, then their costs per minute go down. And it's just a matter of having their tariff reflect that. So it's not about legitimate or illegitimate traffic. It's just about costs and volume, which is how telecom networks work. So all of these are triggers, right? And they just start a process to make sure that your rates reflect your costs. I would agree, and I guess one other note on the minute of use threshold, if one were to use that, um, is that it should be measured over a large enough sample size that you're actually getting, you're seeing a sustained um, increase in the traffic rather than something that might be a seasonal spike or something like that that results in, you know, the, the, the rate going downward and not sure what the path would be for putting it back up again one would, when one would requalify to set your rate higher again potentially if you're uh, adjusting it. Um, so uh, again, to just get into the definitional, um, uh, the, the definitional aspects of the trigger, it's important I think to look at it. We had suggested over a quarterly period before doing any sort of adjustment to, to, to just make sure you've got a right, uh, right size sample. You know, I, I would agree with that. I would add that it would also be helpful that, you know, when you get phone calls uh, asking about why the, the spike, um, even if it's a month or two, that you have a dialogue about what's going on so you can identify early on that it's seasonal or you can identify that it's not and uh, deal with it ap appropriately. But, but I, I echo what um, John Banks said, which is, it's all about costs and volumes and the original purpose of these high access rates in rural areas was premised on low volumes. For whatever reason, over a sustained period of time, those volumes increase. It requires, in, in our view at CenturyLink, that you go back and adjust your rates accordingly to reflect the cost because the premise no longer exists. I, I believe that the idea that we have higher rural rates is to sustain the public switch telephone network in the rural areas and that if we do things to uh, inhibit growth in those areas uh, it's going to be more difficult to stay, sustain and it's going to require more government help to sustain it and so you know we we work in the urban areas we work in the rural areas right and and I would like to see a level playing field between the two there's no reason to inhibit rural areas to sustain their networks. Yeah, I, if I just add, that, that I, I agree. The um, and that's why defining the triggers carefully becomes so important because you've got to make sure that you've got a you know you're not picking up false positives or, or um, overly uh, being overly aggressive in driving the rates downward in a way that doesn't reflect um, or, or, or inhibits cost recovery for operating in what are you know the highest cost areas in the country. So, so that's why I think the definitional triggers become so important. It's also important from a compliance perspective so that companies know in advance what it is they need to do and where they need to be uh, with their rates at a certain point in time rather than having a, a speculation as to whether, well, is this, am, am I sharing revenue, am I not? What, what is this, how does this arrangement fit into the picture? H having precision in defining those triggers uh, I think will help uh, and addressing the concern about uh, cost recovery in rural areas as well as compliance issues. And, and frankly, at the end of the day for us too, um, you know, it, it's also important to us because we need carriers to start paying their bills rather than disputing them over suspected access stimulation. I mean, in some ways the long distance markets become the wild west. People are disputing bills left and right. They're refusing to terminate calls to long distance areas. They're, they're affirmatively ceasing, <laughs> the, in some cases, the, the, the delivery of those calls or, or delaying them. This, getting this issue out of the way and clearing this underbrush will go a long way towards getting the, the uh, PSTN working again. Mr. Erickson, I'd like to follow up on something that you just said. Where do we as the commission draw the line between sustaining the rural areas that need assistance through the Universal Service Fund versus through the ICC regime? What I know is is that uh, on the Native American territory, they didn't have to use any USF at all. And I like that, and they like that, and they prefer that. And uh, that's possible through a high volume access tariff, and it works, and it's in the wholesale marketplace today, and it's a vibrant wholesale marketplace. And um, 
I, I just I, I don't see why that shouldn't be an option. Angela, I think it's a great question. Um, today, I, USF and ICC work in tandem to support universal availability, ubiquity of telephone service at affordable rates, which is sort of a social mandate that we have. And, and I, don't, I, I think we all want to move to explicit subsidies. Well, and didn't Congress tell us to do that in the 96 Act? I know Jonathan has opinion about this. <laughs> yes, Congress told you to do that. It's a bad idea from our viewpoint to continue this sort of implicit subsidies in access rates that are everybody's goal, I think, is to have, you know, the same rates across the country, urban and rural, and move all those subsidies into a broadband fund that we say, here's some broadband dollars, build some broadband, and not have it depend on this implicit, maybe there's money in some access rates in one carrier, but not in the next carrier. So access rates should be, you know, low, very low, and subsidies should be in USF and explicit with explicit obligations. Yeah, Angela, I, I'd agree. Um, and to me, not only are the comments about what you do with your profits irrelevant to if this is the appropriate charge, I think it is an admission that these are subsidies. And I don't know about you, but when I have carriers come to talk to me about in your carrier compensation reform, they talk about cost, they talk about cost, but they're really talking about the cost of their broadband network, they're talking about the cost of running their company, um, and they're talking about subsidies, but when I call it a subsidy, they get very upset. But I, I, think, so, I, mean, I think the important part about these comments, it's, it's, it is an admission that we all know that these are subsidies, and as you noted, there's a place for those, and that's the Universal Service Fund, not air intercarrier compensation. And, and I don't think anybody disagrees with that. It's just a question of a transitional mechanism. I mean, one could look at it and say, well, why are we here talking about access stimulation? Because it's all going to go away once we've reformed and moved to a broadband world. The fact is we're dealing with it because until we get to that broadband world, we, ha we have to deal with the, you know, the, the hand we've been dealt. And so. I think you're right. I think ultimately that's that's where the the end game is, if you will. Um, and I think we we do end up with a hopefully a universal service mechanism that is you know if today there's a three-legged stool in terms of intercarrier compensation, universal service support, and end user rates that make up the you know revenue and cost recovery streams that support a rural carrier operating. You know ultimately it may be a, a two-legged stool for lack of a better way of putting it because you're going to have universal service and end user rates. Um, but until the rest of their long-term reforms occur, we sort of do have to deal with it as how do we get the right level of support built into this implicit mechanism without setting up incentives or, or taking, uh, eliminating or at least curbing the incentives that result in practices that we would deem to be uneconomic or beyond the appropriate level of support. So that's, I think that's where this debate comes in. And in dealing, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> dealing with the world that we have today, what about the very large unpaid amounts, amounts in dispute with current high volume access providers? Aren't the current high volume access tariffs lawful? And I guess maybe a discussion of what the experience has been in Iowa. Well, I, I can talk about Iowa and, and we found, not, it, it's a little different from the FCC, not that the tariffs weren't lawful, but that the traffic at issue was not traffic subject to, to compensation un, under the tariff. And so those amounts paid pursuant to the tariff were, were paid uh, in, in error or, or were not legitimate payments, and they were, they were due to, to be refunded. Uh, and um, I, I think Melissa noted earlier, if it's a fraudulent tariff, which is a different question, um, then, then no, it should not be given a deemed lawful status. What um, the, the unfortunate facts that were found by the IUB were that there, there's we're, we're, we're talking about this in very benign terms, levels of minutes of use and the appropriate rate, but the reality is that these schemes, and I use the word schemes, are, are far more sinister. And in our proceeding, we found that the parties had falsified documents, 
to the FCC and to the Utilities Board to make it look as though they had um, uh, ha had always been end-user customers. We found that some LUX were assessing access rates even though the traffic did not even terminate in their exchange. It terminated in their affiliated exchange because they had over 13 minutes a minute of access. And so that that tariff should never apply to that traffic. And uh, we also found instances where carriers were in an urban area, but they put equipment in a non-rural area, said that they were serving a non-rural exchange, and then they could, I'm sorry, a rural exchange, so they could, so they could apply the, uh, the rural exemption. There's another, and this is not related to, to uh, access charges, but one of these traffic pumpers were using their free conference calling lines to collect universal service dollars, even though they weren't even in a rural exchange. Um, and so my, my point is, is that when that sort of fraud exists, the tariffs are off the table. The tariff either doesn't apply, or if the tariff is used to perpetuate a fraud, that tariff should not be deemed lawful. And that's how I feel about that. Uh, well, we have, to be, we have to be very careful to uh, make sure that we don't paint everybody with the same brush that happened in Iowa. I think uh, if we have been able, I think our tariffs are lawful, and we've been able to uh, negotiate with our IXCs. The IXCs evidently uh, view that as uh, terminated access. They bill their end user for that access. They treat them as access, all of that traffic, yeah. as far as they're concerned. And we've been able to uh, negotiate contracts with the largest I IXCs in the country. And so I, I just want to make sure that we just don't paint everybody with the same brush that's in this business that, that occurred in Iowa, because I don't think that's universally uh, true. I, I agree with that. I'm just saying when it happens, you don't get the protection of your tariff. And that's, that's OK. What she said. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I was not involved in the Iowa proceeding. Um, there was a lot of material that was confidential, and I am not privy to the exact details of, of the fraud there. But we did know that that was going on, and it is what um, prompted uh, CenturyLink, and I'll say Classic Quest um, at the time, to really go forward with this uh, full throttle. And in our view, it is exactly what Krista said, which is these are um, tariffs. The access should not have even applied in the first place. The tariff doesn't apply. And the issue is appropriately in litigation. If I might, too, the, um, I think this highlights the importance of consequences built into the rule rather than having the uh, something that has to be enforced outside of the uh, outside of the rule and, and actually um, I think the examples that, that um, uh, Commissioner Tanner brings up you know as, as I think the gentleman from Techstar said too they're, they're not um, they're not typical of the operations of, of most of these companies they are the vast majority of them there may be a handful who entered into this but we don't make policy I think based upon um, the worst of the bad actors we, we set up a rule that all can enforce uh, can comply with know what they're going to be complying with in advance and, and can be enforced against those who, who do do violate it, um, I, I, you know, not to bring it back full circle, but I think the same kind of uh, reasoning needs to apply in the concept of phantom traffic. I mean, phantom traffic is very similar. I mean, some people have called it theft. It's something where someone is deliberately removing information to, you know, in the one case, you people, people are deliberately driving up their traffic volumes, uh, the argument is, to stimulate receipt of, of monies. In the other case, you've got people deliberately removing information to avoid the payment of monies. It's, it's a very similar dynamic, and we could look at the worst actors there, too, and, and potentially um, throw some stones. But I think the, the, the point bringing it back to fan of traffic would be to build something into the rule, just like you're talking about in the access stimulation context, that would allow one to enforce the rule without having to go back and seek a, you know, file a formal complaint against those who did not pay, to have some consequence built into the rule. So, uh, you know, I sort of want to dovetail back to that to say that, that there, there are two sides of the same coin, and there's a reason why I didn't have them together on this panel, I think. With, with respect to, for example, that point about phantom traffic, does it make sense for the industry to 
not terminate calls, not accept calls that are that are mislabeled? I, I don't Is think that enough pushback to, I, to stop that from happening? I don't think we want to have a uh, mechanism built into the rules. I, you know, I'll leave it to the Commission to decide what they want to do, but to have people start unilaterally deciding when they will block traffic. I think the, uh, the decision was already has been made several times over that that's not a uh, that's, that's not a, a laudable public policy objective to have unilateral determinations about when to, to, when to block the traffic because I don't think someone is uh, providing adequate information. Rather, I think you ought to build into the rule a mechanism that encourages uh, a party to provide that information and sets forth a consequence to the extent they do not. I guess that was my proposed consequence. Yeah, the con <laughs> I, I think the consequence would be economic, just as it is as we're talking about in the traffic uh, stimulation context, rather than having it be um, having people throw up their own artificial um, roadblocks on the PSTN. We're going to conclude this panel at 11 o'clock <clears throat> to give everyone a 15 minute break before this next panel starts. Uh, so perhaps one final question. Under a per minute of use per line volume mechanism, couldn't the local exchange carrier simply add more lines to reduce their volumes per line? Uh, I think that would be the case, right? I think that as we're talking here, we're, we're finding out that there's a certain percentage of people that are always looking to to bend the rules somehow, some way. Um, that's why I like the high volume access tariff because it's the IXC that's paying the bill that's able to police what's going on in the amount of volume that they send. and and and. You know, the, the, the idea that we could take rural phone companies that apply for a rural exemption and make them non-rurally exempt phone companies, basically get them down to the Arbok rate, is, is a great idea, right? I, I, the, the idea of subsidies and, and, and all of that, that's what we're trying to get away from. And so if we do it based on volume of traffic, the IXEs can measure it, the IXEs can adjust their price, and uh, the rural phone company becomes a non-rural phone company, so to speak. I, I think that, yes, companies could add more lines. I mean, to the extent people add new customers, they should have higher volumes. But I would like to echo what Commissioner Tanner said is, we're not talking about small volumes here. We're talking about huge increases that are really beyond the ability of any small rural company to add enough lines to to bring the huge volumes down to sort of a typical average minutes per line. If there are no further comments, thank you all very much. This has been very helpful and uh, looking forward to the next session. Thank you. Okay. We'll take a 10 to 15 minute break started exactly at 11.15. Welcome to the second session of the ICC workshop today to talk about the treatment of VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, for purposes of ICC. I'm Sharon Gillette, I'm Chief of the Wireline Bureau, and I'm moderating today's panel. Um, on February 9th, the Commission issued a notice of proposed rulemaking that uh, would propose to determine the treatment of VoIP for purposes of ICC. And um, not having determined it in the past has actually led to considerable disputes and litigation. and. Uh, so our proposal in the item was to settle this issue uh, once and for all. Although the NPRM does not single out a particular proposal, it does outline options for the treatment of VoIP, ranging from VoIP being treated like all other voice calls, to applying a VoIP specific rate, to applying bill and keep to VoIP calls. And comments came in on Friday, the April the 1st, and we received, I, I believe at last count it was 84 comments, although it may have gone up since then. Uh, so I'm expecting a lively discussion from our distinguished panelists today, and I can tell you from having reviewed the one-page summaries that the panelists were kind enough to supply to us of their comments that they, uh, <coughs> all three of those positions and the whole spectrum of positions that were outlined are represented on today's panel, so I think it's gonna likely to be a pretty lively discussion. Uh, we'll take the same format as the last panel, uh, each panelist will give a three-minute opening, and I must say I really appreciated the um, uh, last panelist sticking to their, there's big red 
uh, numbers there. Our last panels was, were very good at sticking to the timing. Um, let me introduce the panelists and uh, encourage people to uh, put their comments onto note cards and they'll be delivered over here and we'll, we'll ask questions as well as uh, taking them from the online participants. So our panelists today are Eric Einhorn, uh, who's Vice President of Federal Government Affairs from Windstream Communications, Kathy Grillo, Sorry, excuse me, Kathleen Grillo is <laughs> the official. <laughs> uh, Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Verizon Communications. Julie Lane, Group Vice President of Regulatory for Time Warner Cable. Brendan Casper, Senior Regulatory Counsel for Vonage America. Lisa Youngers, Vice President of Federal Affairs for XO Communications, Inc. Paul Gallant, Senior VP of tel and Telecom Analyst for MF Global, the Washington Research Group. and. Last but certainly not least, Peter McGowan, who's general counsel for the New York State Department of Public Service. And uh, joining me as uh, uh, we as questioners, and I'd also like to uh, acknowledge Angie Cronenberg, who's remaining with us, and I'm sure we'll have a question at some point for our panelists, uh, as well as Marcus Mayer, who's uh, is, uh, all, all three of these folks are in the Wireline Bureau, so I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip all the titles. <laughs> Marcus Mayer, uh, Rebecca Goodhart, and Victoria Goldberg, who all work on our intercarrot comp issues here in the Bureau. So with that, Eric, take it away. Uh, thanks. Um, I'd like to thank the, the chairman, commissioners, and FCC staff for holding these workshops and for inviting me to participate today. I think one thing we, uh, we can all agree on is that the current USF and intercarrot comp system is broken, needs to be fixed. And Windstream's been an ardent supporter of rational reform and moving to a unified rate for all types of calls, including VoIP, in conjunction with a reasonable opportunity to recover revenues reduced by the reform. The FCC should encourage the development of innovative services, such as VoIP, but not in a manner that undermines investment in the networks used to deliver these services. Most providers are paying applicable intrastate and interstate access charges today for traffic that terminates on the PSTN. This includes VoIP. I want to stress this. Vast majority of VoIP originated traffic is paying jurisdictionalized rates today. However, a small handful of large providers have recently become more aggressive about claiming that VoIP originated traffic is somehow different and should pay its own special super low rate a self-declared discount, if you will, based on new claims about uncertainty in the law. These particular VoIP providers are abusing the network on which they rely and claiming an unreasonable advantage over their rule-abiding VoIP and non-VoIP competitors, and doing so is contrary to existing FCC rules regarding the termination of traffic on the PSTN. There's no rational basis for treating VoIP and other PSTN traffic differently under the current rules. Both use the same network components. Terminating carriers incur the same costs. And from a customer's perspective, these services appear virtually identical and are marketed as substitutes. The FCC must make it clear that its rules apply to VoIP, to, to VoIP providers placing traffic on the PSTN to pay the, and that they should pay the same rates as all other voice providers and voice traffic. If the FCC doesn't act now, the self-help very well may destabilize the current system before rational reform can take place and undermine the ability of carriers of last resort to serve consumers in high cost areas. This will harm consumers rather than help encourage broadband deployment. Allowing VoIP providers to arbitrarily avail themselves of a lower rate is a different kind of reform. It's reform dictated by a few, a few actors rather than rational reform with reasonable transitions that the NPRM envisions. Windstream has and will continue to work with the FCC, the states, and others in the industry from all sides to develop a path forward on these important issues, and we look forward to doing so. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to appear here today and discuss these issues. I just wanted to start by extending a compliment to the panelists and the staff from the first panel. I thought it was very good, very interesting. And you know, in a lot of these discussions, we tend to all retreat to our you know, respective corners, and I thought that was a good dialogue um, and very substantive. So I'm looking forward to the same experience here today. 
The chairman and the commissioners have been very clear that reforming universal service and intercarrier compensation is one of their top priorities for 2011, and that is welcome news to Verizon. Virtually every player in this debate agrees that these systems desperately need reform. I actually wrote down some of the words that the commissioners and panelists used to describe the current system, and just some of them were Byzantine, broken, tangled, antiquated, and inefficient. On the intercarrier compensation side, there are a host of problems that we need to address, but the most immediate and the most in need of commission action is the issue of what compensation carriers pay to each other when exchanging VoIP traffic from the circuit switch network. This issue has tied the industry in knots for years. It distracts from other priorities and it drives carriers to litigation and disputes. The Commission can put an end to these problems now by establishing a default rate for VoIP PSTN traffic. But Verizon believes that the industry can solve most of these issues through commercial agreements. We have asked policymakers not only to endorse commercial agreements, but to encourage them. Commercial agreements give carriers the flexibility to take account of their individual circumstances and traffic flows and reach mutually agreeable terms. In the absence of these agreements, the FCC should set a default rate. We have suggested dot triple zero seven, which is a rate the wireless and wireline carriers exchange for a lot of different traffic today. So we have a large group here today, and I'm sure we're going to disagree on many things. But I think we'll all agree that this is an issue that needs to get decided quickly, preferably very soon. It's a problem that's only going to get worse over time, and we've seen this before in other contexts, and I think we're seeing it now. Um, the more these traffic volumes increase and the more disputes we have, the problem is only going to get worse. So again, I look forward to discussing this issue with all of you today. Okay, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to appear here today to share Time Warner Cable's views of this important topic. Time Warner Cable believes that the fundamental goal of intercarrier compensation reform should be to harmonize and simplify the current system in a manner that is technologically and competitively neutral. As long as the rates that carriers pay and collect are based on artificial regulatory and jurisdictional distinctions, there will be continuing incentives to game the system. And we therefore believe that with respect to VoIP services, as the Commission has acknowledged, similar services should be subject to similar rules. First, telecommunications traffic terminated by LEX should be subject to the same intercarrier compensation rules regardless of the technology used by the originating or terminating carrier. The NPRM does not define the term VoIP traffic, and in fact, as used, the term is misleading. The Commission appears to consider VoIP traffic to encompass any interconnected VoIP traffic on an interconnected VoIP provider's network. But the use of the term confuses the provision of exchange access service by a local exchange carrier with the provision of a distinct retail interconnected VoIP service by a retail provider. As the NPRM acknowledges, the Commission has already determined that interconnected VoIP traffic is telecommunications traffic based on the pure transmission of the finished service, regardless of whether the end user VoIP service is classified as a telecommunications service or an information service. Therefore, Time Warner Cable believes that any interim step towards fundamental reform of the intercarrier compensation con system should confirm that reciprocal compensation for local calls and access charges for toll calls should apply to traffic delivered to terminating LECs, regardless of whether the traffic originates in circuit switched or IP format, and regardless of whether the traffic is ultimately handed to a VoIP provider for termination to an end user customer. Second, new artificial distinctions amongst types of traffic would, have, would hinder the Commission's long-term goals in this area. Without clarification that traffic originating on or terminating to IP-based networks is subject to the same rules as any other telecommunications traffic, some carriers will continue to exploit artificial distinctions in traffic or ambiguity in the Commission's rules to reduce or avoid their intercarrier compensation obligations. Finally, the ESP exemption does not permit IXCs to avoid paying access charges to LECs. 
Even assuming that interconnected VoIP is an information service, the ESP exemption would not relieve IXCs or LEX from their obligation to pay intercarrier compensation for traffic they deliver to terminating carriers. As I mentioned earlier, it is not interconnected traffic that is the subject of this debate. It is intra or interstate access service, which are telecommunication services. Under the Commission's rules and comparable state authority, users of those access services are obligated to pay, and providers of such services are entitled to collect intercarrier compensation charges associated with that traffic. Again, I thank you for inviting me to speak today, and I look forward to your questions. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to discuss this important topic. Before I um, launch into what we believe the correct approach is, I'd like to just explain a little bit about how Vonage fits into the intercarrier compensation system and, and also how um, other interconnect or over the top interconnected white providers also fit into that system. Unlike the carriers on this panel, we're sort of an indirect participant in the intercarrier compensation system. We pay telcos to take traffic to terminate on the PSTN and to receive traffic from the PSTN and often do not have an end user or a relationship with the terminating carrier. Um, so that means that our, mo our pricing model is to recover our costs through our end user prices only and not through uh, intercarrier charges, which is um, important background into why we think that bill and keep is the appropriate um, solution for intercarrier compensation for VoIP. Bill and keep is an important step towards long-term reform. As the NPRM recognizes, the Commission is seeking to eliminate distinctions, non-cost-based distinctions driven by jurisdictional, jurisdiction and other distinctions. If we, if moving in, uh, if we fail to say, specify that VoIP should be subject to bill and keep, we will harden the carrier's dependence on intercarrier charges and only make it more difficult to achieve long-term reform. Second, VoIP, declaring that, that VoIP is subject to bill and keep promotes the transition to IP networks by um, eliminating the incentive to funnel traffic to the PSTN in order to maximize intercarrier charges. Third, bill and keep is an economically efficient solution. It recovers interconnection costs through end user prices. End user prices, like Vonage's price for service, is subject to um, robust competition. In contrast, intercarrier charges essentially require, you know, they require regulation no matter how competitive the end user market is. Also, bill and keep more accurately reflect, reflects the benefits received from the call. Traditional calling party network pay solutions um, posit that the uh, calling party generates the costs and, uh, you know, and, and should there, or generates, receives a benefit and therefore um, should pay the costs. But in reality, most communications is two way. Both parties receive a benefit. And finally, bill and keep minimizes the need for ongoing regulation because, as I discussed, there's no need to uh, regulate intercarrier charges. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Good morning. Thank you for having me here today to share XO's viewpoint on intercarrier compensation reform. And a special thank you to staff for putting together these workshops and providing an opportunity for all of us to be heard on these issues. The FCC and the industry as a whole has been dealing with intercarrier compensation issues for quite some time. And EXO looks forward to working with the Commission and its industry peers on resolving these issues expeditiously. While examination of these issues is complicated and there are many moving parts, EXO agrees with the other panelists that the time to address intercarrier compensation is now. We are here today to discuss specifically the appropriate compensation framework for VoIP traffic. It may be helpful, however, briefly, to put this all in context and look more broadly at where EXO believes intercarrier compensation reform should be heading overall. Last fall, XO put forward a plan for intercarrier compensation reform on the record, outlining what we believe is the appropriate framework for intercarrier compensation going forward. Essentially, XO believes a comprehensive intercarrier compensation scheme must be forward-looking and include policies that focus on IP networks rather than circuit-switched TDM networks. 
This is because IP networks provide more efficient and lower cost transport and exchange of traffic. The bottom line is XO developed an intercarrier compensation plan that mirrors where telecommunications networks are heading. The central piece of that proposal is that IP interconnection should be encouraged regardless of the technology used to serve particular end users. Adoption of strong IP interconnection policies within the intercarrier compensation regime will create the proper incentives to spur additional broadband deployment. Therefore, EXO proposes that the FCC adopt rules that require carriers to exchange all traffic, whether IP originated or not, in IP format within a five-year period. More details of our plan are, be, are on the record now and will be filed on April 18th with the rest of the comments regarding comprehensive intercarrier comp reform. But the question here today is obviously about VoIP and what the FCC can do now with respect to the treatment of VoIP traffic. Last Friday in our comments, XO put forward what we deem as an interim solution for the treatment of VoIP traffic. This solution is interim, of course, only until the FCC adopts a more comprehensive intercarrier compensation scheme. EXO's pr proposal would apply to all traffic, including VoIP, and so the treatment of VoIP traffic would be addressed under a more permanent solution. Specifically as to VoIP, there has been too much uncertainty for too long regarding the treatment of VoIP and what is the appropriate compensation scheme. As such, EXO proposes that prospectively, VoIP traffic should be treated as a separate category of telecommunications traffic that is not subject to switched access charges and that recip comp rate should be applied on a going forward basis when carriers exchange VoIP traffic on a TDM basis. The FCC has the authority to regulate the compensation for VoIP exclusively and should implement this interim solution immediately. I look forward to discussing these issues with all of you. Hi, I'm Paul Gallant with MF Global. Thank you for the opportunity to join you today. Um, what we do is we provide research to Wall Street about what's happening in Washington that may affect uh, the telecom uh, sector investors interest in stock prices or or bonds and um, and the USF issue Wall Street's primary interest is in the rural phone companies so I'll, I'll mainly talk about the issue through the context of what it means for the rural phone companies and what how Wall Street would like this to play out um, first issue is simply that institutional investors are anxious for reform um, for the past four or five years the Commission has sent conflicting signals about whether it was going to reform the USF and ICC process and what steps it would actually take uh, in the course of reforming those rules. And if you look at the stock price reactions to the FCC signals, you see that Wall Street definitely cares about this issue. Um, and it matter it is a material issue to Wall Street. Um, I think that, and, and I think Wall Street is glad to see that the FCC is sending signals that it cares about what Wall Street thinks about this issue because there is a place in this debate where the rubber kind of hits the road in terms of the cost of capital that RLX um, need to raise to build up broadband in the direction that the FCC wants them to go. Um, so the first question that we get from investors over the past six to nine months since the broadband plan came out over the past year is not what is the FCC going to do to the RLX, but is the FCC going to do anything because the fits and starts on this issue over the past couple of years, the past few years, um, has been a little bit frustrating to Wall Street. So. Uh, I think it's very encouraging that the Commission, the Chairman and the Commissioners put out a blog post saying we're going to get to this issue in the next, hopefully in the next six months or so. So I think that is inspiring some confidence on Wall Street that this issue will be resolved. Um, and that's important and I think that's kind of point one. Second point is that VoIP within the context of USF and intercarrier comp is a really important issue. There was a lot of Wall Street interest in the National Broadband Plan last year because of the likelihood it was going to talk about a framework for reforming USF and intercarrier comp. And I think Wall Street reacted positively to both the substance and the tone of the National Broadband Plan and how it talked about this issue because it had discussion of transition plans and phase-ins and, you know, a sensitivity to the financial realities of the companies that are receiving this money today. And I think VoIP has the potential, though, to be a bit of an X factor in how the FCC completes this transition process because there are certain approaches within the framework of the NPRM that would have um, potentially fairly negative consequences for the RLEX and their ability to go to the market uh, and borrow money and expand broadband. And we can talk in a little bit more detail about how each of those approaches, I think, would be viewed by Wall Street. But I think the, the broad spectrum of issues that the, or options that the FCC laid out in the NPRM on VoIP are a pretty important and um, potentially dramatically different um, path than what the, the broadband plan was anticipating. Um, 
Good morning, and thank you for inviting uh, New York. Uh, I applaud the FCC's uh, efforts, and I think there's a lot of momentum uh, behind the, the effort to reform intercarrier compensation. It's pretty clear to me it's going to happen. Um, I'd like to just address a couple of remarks in the, from the perspective of trying to manage the reform, because that's what we're doing in New York. We have a docket that's outstanding now where we're attempting to uh, generically for the state uh, develop uh, a new uh, system that will reform, get to the FCC's goal. I think it's our goal as well. I think there are three reasons <clears throat> for reforming the legacy access system. One is the cost structures are changing. IP uh, is introducing a completely new uh, cost structure. The trends of traffic moving away from the legacy regime are clear and suggest that the legacy system simply isn't sustainable. So we need to focus on the transition. And thirdly, where an inner exchange provider operates in an affiliated manner with a long distance provider, uh, I think it's clear that the above cost access regime continues competitive inequities uh, via cross subsidization through contributory rates. Access charges are well priced well above cost, and it's my view that creating a definitive glide path to uh, more rationally price intercarrier compensation actually gives the LEX an incentive to move to more efficient IP platforms and develop a sustainable business model. They will either get to a more e effective and efficient cost structure or they will not and they will probably not be sustainable in the long term anyway. And there's a lot of competitive carrier carriers who are entering into the markets who may take over where they are unable to continue. So in thinking about the problem of reforming the legacy system, uh, let me just cent center on three points. First, as I mentioned, the costs are changing. We're going to get to a lower cost structure, so we've got to get there. Uh, second, where intercarrier traffic is exchanged on an integrated basis with a long distance provider, uh, there, there is, if there's a symmetrical rate being exchanged, uh, then a reduction in access rates should be less painful financially to the carrier. Uh, the loss of access revenue uh, would be offset by the long distance carrier's reduction in access costs. But the, a lot of local exchange carriers in New York and I think elsewhere uh, are going to be stressed uh, and further are stressed now and will be further stressed as uh, the access revenues diminish. So as we transition, um, I see the VoIP providers as in relatively good financial shape. They are no longer the nascent technology which needs regulatory protection. Um, but LEX, on the other hand, are stressed financially and in limited areas, uh, they are the only provider. So we need to recognize that we need reform, uh, but I see the definitive path to lower access charges as an incentive for the LEX to invest in and gravitate to the more cost-effective and sustainable IP network. VoIP traffic should be subject to the legacy regime with uh, carrier access and reciprocal compensation. Many VoIP carriers, as we're hearing today on the panel, have been able to do that and have been able to successfully enter the market. To the extent VoIP carriers resist the legacy system, I see it uh, as part of the cost of the transition. And the most important thing, I think the, the, the priority today, the chairman indicated the priority is to reform the access system. We are in New York, many states have already done it, we are reforming the system. We need as many tools as possible to help us get through the transition. To the extent some VoIP providers are not going to uh, contribute to the access regime, it's going to make the transition all the more difficult. So we want to we, we want to reform. Uh, but we need as many tools as possible to help us get there. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all for, uh, for, uh, for your comments. And uh, I'd like to start off the questioning with a uh, question for Paul. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to point out that we always have to be clear about our terminology here at the commission. And uh, you used a couple of terms that uh, I think Wall Street interprets somewhat differently from regulatory uh, folks. One of those is X factor. Just. <laughs> 
<laughs> Some people in this room have a very specific meaning of that term, <laughs> people who actually construct price cap regulations. Um, the other was, uh, no, just uh, seriously though, to clarify what you mean by rural carriers, uh, you know, here at the Commission, rural carriers encompasses about 800 holding companies, most of which are not public. I think you're largely referring to a company like a Windstream, a mid-sized carrier, is that correct? And is that right? Okay, and um, the 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 question for you was you you mentioned that uh, that uh, that the different proposals in the NPRM might be uh, reacted to differently from Wall Street. I wondered if you could be more specific. Uh, in particular, the the NPRM laid out a spectrum from the bill and keep idea, which we heard Vonage supporting, um, the uh, VoIP specific rate idea, which we heard I think in slightly different forms from Verizon and EXO. And then uh, the idea that uh, VoIP is exactly the same as existing traffic, which I think we heard from Windstream and Time Warner. Um, could you speak a little bit about how investors might react to that spectrum? Uh, right. So on the uh, on the option of uh, interconnected VoIP providers paying the full access charges today, I think that is really the only option that would actually improve the. Um, stability and the predictability of the rural carriers access charge revenue stream uh, that really helps give confidence to lenders that they can keep lending money to RLX at a at a reasonable rate um, either of the other two options the the bill and keep option or the set a VoIP specific rate option tend to I think potentially replace one set of or one arena of uncertainty with another in the sense that it's not immediately clear whether the originating, if the originating carriers have the ability under uh, either a bill and keep regime or um, a VoIP specific rate regime to determine what is VoIP traffic and what is not VoIP traffic, um, there is the potential for under certain, depending on how originating carriers behave, um, the potential for a significant reduction in access charges. And the, the consequence of that, if that were to play out, and I don't know if it would, but if, it, if that's how things play out under either of those options, if the commission goes that way, is for Wall Street to look at that and say, these access charge revenues are not predictable anymore, and we are going to adjust downward our, our models to reflect that, and we're going to charge RLX more to borrow money to build broadband. And even in extreme cases, um, even money that the RLX have in the pipeline to build broadband today could potentially be subject to um, repurposing, you know, either for share buybacks or whatever, and that's obviously not the direction the Commission would want to see RLX go, but this is a, a fairly predictable revenue stream that, again, under certain scenarios of either bill and keep or, or a VoIP specific rate, um, would introduce even more uncertainty, I think, into their, into the Wall Street's view of these companies than we have today. might arise under either a VoIP specific approach or a bill and keep and this is sort of I guess a question I'll start start with Lisa but any of the other panelists as well that are sort of suggesting either a VoIP specific or, or bill and keep approach um, to the extent that some of the uncertainty comes from the potential uncertainty about what traffic will be treated as VoIP are there approaches that you see to um, identifying that in a way that I think you know will W would give comfort to the terminating providers and others that you know there, there's a way to identify here's here's the traffic we're talking about there provide there's maybe some certainty then about you know what's the universe of traffic over some time period that's going to be under one particular regime versus another um, so XO's position of course is that um, VoIP should be subject to recip comp and your question is about how do you identify that VoIP traffic and in our comments we talked about that VoIP traffic um, should be designated up front as VoIP um, either by agreement there are agreements in place that dictate how this is done with carriers or through some sort of industry standard so some of some examples some possibilities are um, one way to do it is having originating carrier populate the JIP the jurisdictional indicator parameter um, which would identify it as uh, VoIP traffic or you could use some sort of factor on the back end um, factors of course are done today um, you could come up with some sort of factor that works. Um, XO is also open to any other mechanism that might work or might be agreed to by the industry. Um, we're open to um, other ideas. 
So the originating carrier would have to self-designate, and then in our comments we suggested that the uh, terminating carrier would have some sort of audit right, some sort of audit ability um, to verify that that in, indeed the originating carrier is identifying the traffic correctly, and if they are not, there should be some sort of recourse for that. So for example, um, charging access if it truly is in VoIP. So we actually had a fairly similar proposal. Um, we actually had a fairly similar proposal. Um, we think that the, the, the traffic should be identified as VoIP in either the billing information or the signaling information. Um, because we're not a carrier, I'm not, you know, we're not entirely clear what the best candidate is, but one thing we saw was that from the IP to uh, PSTN gateway, uh, you can populate the calling party category, uh, which is a designation on the PSTN side and can be populated with information from the IP headers. And then you, um, we would suggest that you include that in the phantom traffic rules that you couldn't falsely populate traffic as VoIP that is, that is not VoIP. Yeah, I mean, I don't know um, if there's much more to add in terms of that. I mean, Lisa said it really well. And I guess another part of this discussion that, you know, comes into play when you talk about Marcus, you know, how would you tell VoIP from circuit switch traffic? The, the sooner we move to a comprehensive reform where there's a single rate for all traffic, the less, you know, obviously there are ways that carriers do that today in the wireless space, and those can be extended to, to VoIP traffic. Um, but I do think that the sooner, you know, we move to deal with these larger issues, you know, the less of a, of a concern that really is. A follow up. Um, Kathy, you recommended um, moving to commercial negotiations. Mm -hmm. And so part of the questions comes from the audience is, uh, how the commercial uh, negotiations work when there might be an unequal um, bargaining power and also should there be how would the backstop work when negotiations back break down Peter. and yeah and also I'd like to open this up to Peter when Kathy's done to talk about what was the experience in New York we had a 2008 decision which encouraged parties to negotiate a uh, commercial arrangement for the treatment I think of Vonage's traffic and so if you could speak about how that worked as well, well I mean Commercial agreements work in many different contexts between many different players. In fact, as um, David was saying on the first panel, that's how the internet works today. And um, you know, I don't know exactly what you mean by unequal bargaining power. I think people can use that in different ways in different contexts. But um, you know, I know from our perspective, when we're negotiating with carriers, the focus is on a reciprocal arrangement. So there's a quality in terms of what one carrier pays and, and the other carrier pays for VoIP. And a lot of times we end up at a rate that's you know lower than dot triple zero seven, frankly, in, in a lot of cases. So I mean I think they work well in a lot of different contexts, especially when both parties are motivated to to get something done and to you know bring it out of the regulatory um, regime. Um, I, I guess the the problem of uh, the balance of power might be evidenced when a carrier unilaterally suggests that they're going to move to a particular really low rate. Uh, that is, to me, not exactly a well uh, arranged and uh, balanced uh, arrangement. Uh, so I, I, I don't know, I can't recall what happened as a result of the 2008 decision that you're referring to, um, but I would think it would be very difficult. I mean, obviously, if you work out an arrangement with another carrier, that's fine. But if you don't, what's the default? That's the problem. What's the default? And uh, the default is typically, I think, a tariffed rate. And if people aren't going to pay the tariffed rate, then there are disputes. And then we have court decisions that you know, go through the whole thing and we take up a lot of time, and we take up a lot of effort and a lot of resources. So I, I guess these, these arrangements are not always worked out so well, and they have produced disputes. And um, speaking of a default rate, um, on the issue of a low rate versus bill and keep approach for this traffic, uh, at what point do the accounting costs outweigh the benefits? And maybe you could speak to specifically what are the benefits of a low rate and the uh, the incentives as well, and, and maybe we could start with Kathy. Uh, 
That's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of carriers that have discussed the dot triple zero seven rate have raised that issue. You know, does it cost more to bill it, frankly, than it does to move to to uh, zero? And I, from our perspective, we've always been concerned about not having a positive rate, just because we think that you know we're just a little concerned about arbitrage opportunities just in the general structure um, if you had a zero um, so I think that's a valid that's a valid concern um, you know one of the things we've said is you can always move to zero eventually you know once you move to zero it's hard to move back up to dot triple zero seven you can always go to dot triple zero seven and the Commission can decide you know after that whether it makes sense to keep a positive rate or not and to move to bill and keep so that's that's kind of how we've looked at it Well, that's a good question because I don't know that we do either. But um, you know, it's just a concern generally. Uh, one of the th you know the prior panel was really interesting because in a lot of cases you don't know where some of these arbitrage opportunities will go. I don't think anyone anticipated you know what happened with the ISP bound traffic and all the problems that that came out of that. So it's hard to anticipate these, which is why we think it's so important for the commission to move quickly to a single rate. You know, one rate. Um, that's low and uniform across the board. It just makes it easier, obviously, to avoid these sort of things. So I, I don't have anything specific that I could point to. I mean, in the wireless world, carriers exchange traffic and bill and keep a lot. Um, but I'm just saying, from our perspective, that's why we've we've sort of looked at it a little bit differently. Well, one way you could address potentially some of those unanticipated arbitrage opportunities is to have a mechanism. I mean, like IP. Um, like I, you know, backbone agreements for IP often have, um, you know, if you go out of a certain balance of traffic, you know, three to one maybe is uh, something that's commonly cited. Then you then you pay. So that might be one way you could sort of go to a bill and keep model, but still have some protection against, you know, ways you haven't thought of for people to take advantage of the bill and keep system. And, and, well, we think <coughs> RECIPCOM should apply. VoIP context here, um, we are looking at bill and keep for our larger intercarrier comp proposal, and that is um, completely dependent on whether or not traffic is in balance or not. That's exactly right. So I would echo those comments if you're looking at a bill and keep regime. Yeah, I would, I would simply add that you probably need uh, the balance thing under the law. I think also seeks balance in order to do bill and keep. So if you're not in balance, I think that is going to be a problem. So. As we're trying to sort of size this problem, can you, can the windstream others uh, let us know how you're quantifying what percentage of the traffic you're receiving as VoIP, if you have any way to determine that? And similarly for Verizon and others that you're carrying the VoIP traffic on your IXC as well as receiving on the ILEC side, how is this, the VoIP traffic growing and, and uh, how has it been trending? I'd also like to get Paul's perspective on this as well if he has one. Okay. Um, well, we don't really know um, if traffic, if uh, carriers are sending us uh, traffic as VoIP or not. We do know that there are certain carriers that have disputed traffic and said that it's VoIP and they're not going to pay us access charges on certain traffic. So that's one way we do know. As I said in my uh, statement, uh, this is this is really a. a I, I describe it as a new phenomenon. Uh, they're they're recently have been a couple large carriers that have been a lot more aggressive about this so we know that that's an issue um, and you know to me the way I think about this is it's not you know the the disputes the current disputes are certainly a problem the thing that really keeps me up at night though is what Paul what Paul talked about which is the the potential to pull that sweater on the, pull the string on the sweater and just unravel the entire system before the commission can do what it has set out to do in a very aggressive schedule. So um, I think this is really about stability of the current system. We all agree that it's not a great system, that it needs to be fixed. But if you totally destabilize the system before you fix it, you know, that's a plan too. You've just changed the, the way that we operate and it's in a way that um, is not that does not have those those transitions that are so important for the goals of the Commission in terms of getting broadband out to everyone 
So let me start where, where Eric stopped on transitions. Um, we do think it's very important for the commission just to decide this issue now. There is just incredible uncertainty in the market about this. Carriers are doing different things across the board. And the commission, we think the most important thing is for the commission just to decide this issue going forward. I think rather than, you know, have a prolonged period after that where there is, you know, the instability that Eric talked about, I think that will be, create momentum towards reforming the system overall. And in that context, we do support and actually think it's important that the commission have transitions. You know, as Lisa said, there's a lot of moving parts when you're talking about universal service and intercarrier comp. And there's a lot of different levers that we can move you know, to soften the landing, so to speak, when we transition, you know, from the current system we have to, you know, a single low rate. There's a lot of things you can do with respect to universal service and, and other things. So we support that. I think that's an important consideration. But for the time being, I think we need an answer to the question um, of VoIP and what the compensation rate should be. To your question, Rebecca, about um, the volumes, you know, I don't have exact numbers. I know it's relatively small right now in terms of VoIP. And you asked whether or not, you know, we are seeing that trend up. And yes, I mean, I think that's where the industry is going generally, obviously. So we will see that trend up. We will see those numbers grow um, year over year, which is why I think it's really important to get some clarity now. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I know. Just to that point, um, I think that we can agree um, we're on the same page in terms of a, a unified low rate. Um, we agree with Verizon on that in the long term, and I think that we would say let's hasten that process rather than take an interim step to cause more confusion, uh, give more incentives for people to game the system, and have a separate rate um, in that interim period. It's important to resolve it um, and keep it as simple as possible during the, the period that you're, you're taking the path to a unified low rate for everything. I guess on the point that, you know, the, the, the volume is relatively low but growing, I mean, doesn't that give us time to phase in? I mean, the commission is not talking about, you know, just, you know, adopting bill and keep or something like that and, you know, letting the chips fall where they may for the rural carriers. I mean, they are talking about, you know, making implicit subsidies explicit, you know, funding it through USF. And if you have, you know, relatively low volume of VoIP now, that gives you a chance for the system to it you know, for you to actually get those mechanisms installed and identify specifically what the subsidies are and whether you're actually getting what you're, you know, what, whether the funding is appropriate for the need, which is the problem with sort of having things funded through intercarrier charges. You don't really know what you're getting. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I, wanted to follow, I wanted to follow up on that. Um, I mean, that sounds good, but I think it's totally impractical and, and wouldn't happen, um, play out, it wouldn't play out that way. Um, the the fact is that there's really no way to tell what you know to confirm what this traffic is when it comes in we basically have to take carriers word for it it's coming in over trunks that is inter, you know where the traffic's often intermingled with other traffic so although you know and this is this is why I put it up front in my statement although it's not a huge problem now in terms of the disputes that we're having they're real and they're a huge drain on our resources this problem can explode really quickly and I think that it probably would if the Commission were to come out and set aside a special low rate for VoIP suddenly a lot of traffic that currently isn't classified as VoIP would be and the fact that we have a lot of traffic that is VoIP today that's paying access charges suddenly all of that traffic would migrate into the bucket of the low rate so you would have the instability suddenly that Paul talked about so have there been any allegations of carriers basically saying all our traffic is VoIP because we can't tell the difference has that already happened in the marketplace yeah I, I think increasingly that has. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know um, specifically carrier by carrier, but I am confident there, are, there are some carriers that are telling us that all their VoIP is, uh, all their traffic is VoIP. Um, the problem is that, uh, you know, increasingly it's bigger carriers that are claiming more of their traffic under this this banner. Well, and it's unclear to me how, it, on the terminating side, because there's just not. Um, as much originating, but if we're if we're taking a call from a long distance carrier, um, and we're ultimately handing it off to a, a retail VoIP provider, how that long distance carrier 
you know knows how it's terminating and they're taking the position um, in some cases that that it's all VoIP as, as you mentioned but I'm not sure how they they know on the terminating side you know whether it's VoIP or not and I guess they would know from the originating side who they're picking it up from but um, if it's telecommunications traffic that they're getting from the originating lack and they're handing to the terminating lack then then how do they know to take the position that it's VoIP Sharon, I think part of, isn't part of the problem, though, that there isn't a rule today. There isn't a clear signal from the FCC in terms of what the right rate is. So if with that in place and, you know, a system that uses factors and, you know, audits as a backstop, um, you know, you may not see the result, Eric, that you're talking about. Because today, you know, the, in terms of what you're seeing and, frankly, what we're seeing, too, there is no rule. So... Uh, Arguably, a lot of carriers are taking the position there is no rule, so that makes it easier to do what you're talking about. So, in a w in a way, having a commission decision and then having rules around it would help improve that situation. Yeah, and we and I agree with Kathy. Actually, s taking a step right now on an interim solution would actually provide stability, not dis not destabilize, as has been suggested here. And just to echo what's already been said, both scenarios are happening today. Carriers are treating it as um, you know they're setting it down local trunks treating it as enhanced or they're treating the traffic as um, telecommunications service and pay switched access on it but both scenarios are happening so I agree with Kathy that we need an interim proposal now to provide consistency across the board and I actually think that provides stability it doesn't destabilize where we are assuming there's some reasonable way to Verify. Oh, of course, uh, right. A safe harbor or some it, other way right. of verifying the, what the is and what isn't. Or the JIP and right. then audit it, it only works if there's some way, it seems to me, if there's a, you know. So just real quick, real quick, there's a data point here. Uh, the commission just recently put out its report with the, uh, um, you know, lines and service and which buckets, right? And I th I'm just off the top of my head, I think it was the... the 21.8% VoIP. Yeah, so it, it's a very large percentage of the traffic and growing um, that is probably originating as VoIP um, that's paying access that is pay, paying access charges today so I don't know you know why anyone would think that that traffic wouldn't suddenly fall into this other bucket and you know that's a pretty pretty big cliff to get pushed over so this is a, a question that came in from the audience and I'll sort of throw out throw it out to, to any of the panelists as it relates to your proposals but the question is um, how does a particular uh, intercarrier compensation framework, and I guess specifically for, for VoIP in, uh, purposes of this panel, um, create incentives for the exchange of traffic on an IP basis, um, not only sort of at the edge of the network, but sort of throughout the, the entire network? Um, well, our, <laughs> our proposal um, for intercarrier comp reform on, as a whole is that the FCC, when it adopts a comprehensive scheme that um, it include the requirement that carriers uh, interconnect on an IP basis and that do so in a certain amount of time we've suggested five years and that um, there be incentives um, created to get carriers to that point and that includes um, at some point if a carrier is still um, interconnecting on a TDM basis that that rate be different um, and it would probably be higher and that is to incent carriers to move to IP interconnection agree with that I think it would be an incentive for carriers companies to move to IP um, and help facilitate this transition to an all IP network which is what you know most of us want to see yeah I mean I think that 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 changing the regime and and saying that there's something special for VoIP um, will actually do the opposite I think that if they if the Commission were to decide that um, it's tele it should be treated like telecommunications traffic um, that you're actually uh, indicating that there's not a preference any longer for TDM traffic and I'm not sure how you incent Lex to um, move their networks to IP for originating calls if they can't be assured that they're going to be compensated um, when those calls are terminated in IP on their network so I think that I that it would actually incent carriers to move to IP to treat it as telecommunications and I also think that the Commission um, could make it clear that when carriers exchange traffic, regardless of the technology they use, that they should have to accept traffic in IP format. Uh, I'd add one specific way that I think that Bill and Keep in particular can help accelerate the, the transition to IP networks. 
one, I, it's one question that people often have about bill and keep is how the interconnection works, you know, the rules for interconnection. But that's sort of a very telco-centric view of the world. You know, you have to build a trunk to here, you know, a meet-me trunk between the two networks. A lot of times for the VoIP traffic that we carry, you know, we go to telecom carriers over the public internet. So you sort of eliminate that, um, the need to build trunks out to each other. So, you know, if you go to bill and keep, it might encourage some of the, you know, say for instance, a rural telco who Vonage or someone is not anywhere close to, to move their traffic, you know, convert it to IP and move it over the, basically move it over the public internet in order to interconnect with us more efficiently. Um, lightning round here. Um, I, I've always wanted to be on the other side of this one, <laughs> as opposed to being in front of Congress having to do this. <laughs> okay, uh, what, uh, let's let's go down the line. I'll start with Eric on this. What's your position on whether the compensation obligation for VoIP traffic should be prospective only or applied retroactively? Question from the audience. Uh, I think it applies now, so I'd say both. Perspective. Uh, I think there's been enough, you know, uncertainty and enough litigation over the. I think we should, you know, if the commission takes a position, it should do it quickly and just make it perspective only. And I agree with Eric. I think it applies now. So, both. Uh, I would say prospectively. Uh, there, there. I agree with Kathy. There's been enough uncertainty that it would be, uh, it would be reasonable to apply it prospectively. Um, prospectively, for the same reasons, um, you know, there's been enough uncertainty, enough litigation, enough disputes, and um, in order for it to apply right now, the FCC would have had to have found that it's telecommunications services, and they haven't found that yet. So I don't think that works, and it, it has to be prospective. Okay, we're in lightning round, but I'm going to come back with a question about that later. Yeah. Um, investors are entirely forward-looking, so the only thing they would care about would be the prospective treatment of uh, avoid mm -hmm. traffic. I mean, if they if the commission were to uh, it would be free money to, you know, if the commission were to order accrued liability to be paid to uh, to the RLX. Uh, retrospective would be would be certainly a way to increase the risk, I guess, to those who are taking this gamble. But I don't think uh, it's going to be. I mean, I think prospective is only the only really practical way to avoid even more uh, disruption and chaos. So I guess maybe the the flip side is quick. <laughs> Rather than retrospective or prospective, quick. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, leave it to the state commission to find that middle ground. <laughs> right, there we go. Um, I wanted to just go back to something you said, Lisa, the, and, and ask you and Julie to square it up because you're saying it's not telecommunication services, and Julie, you're saying it's telecommunications. So can we understand why we're sure, hearing different to, things there? To clarify, the FCC hasn't reached a decision to date on the classification. It hasn't decided if it's telecommunications service or information services. Um, and in fact, I think you reiterated that in your NPRM, and they would have had to have made that finding for um, access to apply. It is telecommunications. That was decided in the Vonage order and other places, but that's a different, obviously that's a different thing altogether. Well, and I think, I think we agree. I mean, the, the commission has not determined whether uh, interconnected VoIP is a telecommunications service or an information service, but apart from that, it has said that, that interconnected VoIP traffic is telecommunications traffic. So. You know, I think that 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 it's that that that's sufficient. And how does that apply in the access context? Well, I th again, I think what we're not. You know, sense? if you think about how VoIP traffic, when it's when an IXC hands a call to a LEC, it's generally in TDM format. It's not VoIP, and, and whether it's delivered ultimately to a VoIP provider, and um, that interconnected VoIP provider provides interconnected VoIP and unclassified service to an end user, that's one thing. But what the IXC hands to the, um, the LEC that ultimately gets to the end user that's served by VoIP is telecommunications. So um, I'm not sure that there needs to be a, de a declaration that interconnected VoIP is a telecommunications service in order to apply access to the traffic that's exchanged between an IXC and a LEC. Um, I have a question for all of the panelists. In the NPRM, we talk about working in cooperation with the states to achieve an air carrier compensation reform. What do you see as the role for the states in terms of the uh, uh, treatment of VoIP? Uh, well, since we think 
uh, and trust state access applies. We think they certainly have a role, and um, we we have been involved in lawsuits in the states and um, before state commissions who have decided that issue uh, too. So we think the states have a role so long as the system is uh, the way it is today um, with a bifurcated role with, with local and interstate traffic, um, they have a role. Yeah, I think the states have a role in a lot of context in this debate. Um, we think that the Commission itself has determined that VoIP is an interstate service that's subject to exclusive jurisdiction by the FCC. Um, and in this context, for in terms of setting the rate for VoIP, that that should be done by the Commission. I, I just want to clarify, we're almost out of time on this oh. panel, so let's make it lightning round and go down the line on this question. It'll be our last question. Okay. I think that the, the, the Federal Communications Commission should declare that it's subject to access charges, and then the states certainly have a role on the interest state side. Um, and then I also think that the FCC should reaffirm what Kathy mentioned, the 2004 ruling that, um, that states shouldn't be regulating the retail interconnected VoIP service. I would say that it's, you know, uh, as Kathy said as well, um, you know, the FCC has decided that VoIP is interstate more or less in the, the Vonage order and they have the authority to set the rates, uh, you know, across the board and so I think I don't see as much of a state role in this area. Um, I agree the FCC has uh, <coughs> determined that this is an interstate service. Um, I agree with what was just said and I think the Vonage order carved out for the state um, public safety and consumer type roles that um, could be ongoing. I think introducing a state role into the uh, into this process, um, whatever the public policy benefits or the uh, intergovernmental benefits, would probably introduce more uncertainty and more. If there's an opportunity for states to complicate the ability of um, uh, rural telcos to collect some of the some of these um, access charges, I think that would not be a welcome development just from the the investor perspective. But I don't see the states as necessarily trying to complicate it. I see, I, I, I think the FCC has classified nomadic as interstate. It has not successfully, I don't think, classified fixed as inter, interstate. I think that was uh, challenged and it was de deemed to be not ripe uh, in the Eighth Circuit, if I remember. Um, and I think that the states do have a role in, uh, in terms of establishing the wholesale treatment. I think I would also like to note that New York and I think a number of states have been have tried to be very nimble about not over asserting jurisdiction on the retail uh, stuff on the retail services so I think uh, I think in New York we have been very uh, careful about trying to only assert jurisdiction that is truly needed okay well let me thank our panelists and uh, and turn it over to Roger who will uh Tell us what we're supposed to do next. You're all free to eat. Uh, if you can get back here by 125, so we can start promptly at 1.30 and stay on schedule. We have little sheets about lunch places for those of you who don't know right here at the front table. Thank you all. And welcome to the third and final session of the Intercarrier Compensation Workshop today. My name is Rebecca Goodhart, Associate Chief of the Wireline Competition Bureau, and I will be moderating this panel. We had two very productive sessions this morning and expect a similar lively discussion this afternoon. This afternoon's session will focus on developing a recovery mechanism as part of intercarrier compensation reform. The NPR make, makes clear that we propose to develop a predictable transition with no flash cuts. As part of ICC reform, we sought comment on how to develop a recovery mechanism to enable the industry and investors time to adjust to reduced ICC revenues. The NPRM asked a variety of questions, including whether the FCC should focus on cost or revenue recovery, and if we focus on revenues, what revenues should be considered, regulated, non-regulated, net revenues versus gross revenues, and how the FCC should look to reasonable end user charges, and finally, developing a criteria for access to the Universal Service Fund for areas that are uneconomic to serve, absent support. We also asked data to help size and develop the recovery mechanism. We have an excellent panel ready to dig into these issues, as well as a distinguished team of questioners. This panel will be 90 minutes. I will first quickly introduce 
the panelists and my colleagues. And then each panelist will have three minutes to summarize his or her positions, followed by questions from the panel, the audience, both online and in person. Turning to our panel, we have John Rose, President of OPASCO, Ken Mason, Vice President of Government and Regulatory Affairs for Frontier, Bob Quinn, Senior Vice President, Federal Regulatory and Chief Privacy Officer, AT&T Services, Charles McKee, Vice President, Federal and State Regulatory for Sprint Nextel, David Bergman, Assistant Consumers Council Chair, Nasuka Telecommunications Committee, and Frank Loudon, Managing Director, Raymond James. We are also honored to have Iowa Board Member Krista Tanner, as well as Peter McCowan, uh, General Counsel for the New York State Department of Public Service, who have agreed to ask questions on this panel. Joining me as questioners, Victoria Bold Goldberg, who's an attorney advisor in the Wireline Bureau's Pricing Policy Division, John Baker, our chief economist, Bill Sharkey, senior economist in OSP. Next to him is Dan Ball, attorney advisor in the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Kevin King, who is a telecommunications broadband analyst. And with that, I'll turn it over to John. Thank you for inviting APASCO. Uh, APASCO has 470 uh, small rate of return uh, regulated companies across the country. Our companies are committed to achieving universal broadband availability and adoption. The National Broadband Plan recognizes the need to create the right incentives. And one of those incentives is intercarrier compensation reform and, and having a recovery mechanism. This is a very important point to us and it is one message I want to leave you th today is this. To be beneficial to rural consumers, it's essential that there's a sufficient recovery mechanism to provide the RLX a transition. It is important to remember that RLX rely on access charges for 30% of their revenues and, and USF another 40%, which equals 70%. The lack of an adequate recovery mechanism will necessitate significant uh, rate hikes for both basic and advanced services, and this is to pay repay loans. To get into kind of the plan is that we recommend as, as a first step the commission enable RLACs at the option of the state commissions, and Chairman Jenikowski mentioned some of this this morning, is to lower intrastate originating terminating switched access rates to interstate levels. And this would be with a benchmark rate of $25 or, or around, that which would include the local rate, interstate, intrastate, slicks, contributions by state, USF. In the first year, RLX would be permitted to recover the revenue loss after the voice rate benchmark has either been charged or imputed. In subsequent years, as the switch access revenue goes down, so would the recovery mechanism. We believe this is a balanced approach and it would immediately eliminate a major source of rate arbitrage and c help contain the fund. Uh, the adoption of a benchmark would be, help be fair to early adopter states. The total estimated revenue loss to RLX from reducing intrastate rates to interstate levels would be around $300 million. With the adoption of a benchmark, would that put it probably under $200 million. And then if we adopted uh, uh, some phantom traffic reforms as well as, as VoIP pan access, that would make it even lower. And we think that uh, it's, it's a major step to fix phantom traffic, to address VoIP, to create a restructuring mechanism, lower intrastate rates down. And once these steps are taken, I think then we could uh, go look into further steps and have an, a, a reasonable transition. Thank you. Good afternoon. I would like to thank Chairman Janikowski, the FCC commissioners, and the commission staff for hosting today's workshop and for pr providing Frontier an opportunity to present its views on the important topics of intercarrier compensation and universal service reform. Frontier supports the steps the Commission is taking in evaluating reform to both intercarrier compensation and the Universal Service Fund. Currently, Frontier receives approximately 10% of its revenues from these sources. Not surprisingly, these two sources of revenues are a critical elements supporting Frontier's aggressive deployment of broadband to our rural markets, markets where we will never have the scale, scope, or a customer base comparable to what exists in more urban parts of the country. Given the integrated nature of this support, it is critical to reform ICC and USF in lockstep, as action on one can have direct impact on the other. We recognize and accept that there will be an impact on the way we recover for our ongoing investment in our rural markets going forward, but we also point out that these revenues enable mid-sized ILECs like Frontier 
to meet the Commission's challenge of deploying broadband to rural America. Last summer, as part of our acquisition of 4.8 million access lines from Verizon, Frontier made aggressive commitments to deploy broadband and improve service. We were able to make that capital investment commitment in part because of the revenues that we received from universal service and air care compensation. The primary theme you will hear from Frontier on reform is transition. Whether it is the phase down of ICC rates or the shift of the universal service fund into a more explicit broadband fund, it is critical that these transitions occur in a way that are gradual and predictable in order to provide an appropriate glide path for Frontier and others. Companies must be given the ability to adjust for these changes in their business to ensure that ongoing investment in broadband in rural and high cost areas can continue. Transition must also be the central theme of any discussion of access recovery and should affect the way the Commission balances its goals of modernizing ICC and USF for broadband while controlling the size of the Universal Service Fund. In, an in fact, an appropriate transition is the key to making sure these goals aren't in conflict. Any transition that is done too quickly will place the burden on the companies that currently collect ICC and their rural end users. Recovery of ICC revenues from end user rates needs to be measured and limited, as is any use of the Universal Service Fund. Frontier does not expect access recovery to provide dollar for dollar replacement and acknowledges that ICC is a revenue stream that is currently declining. However, it does remain an important source of revenue and cash flow, cash flow that provides Frontier the means to expand broadband avail availability to large areas of rural America. Moving to a proposed ICC end state without the opportunity to replace or at least have the opportunity to replace substantial amounts of these foregone revenues for a period of time will directly impact Frontier's ability to continue to invest. Frontier agrees the USF is currently under pressure both in size and in terms of the end user contribution percentage. However, in order to ensure that mid-sized companies and other rural LECs, especially those that have made explicit commitments to expand broadband, continue to have adequate cash flows to meet those commitments, the FCC will need to examine whether additional access replacement funding will be required from the Universal Service Fund. Frontier believes that answer is yes, but this amount can and should be controlled by the speed of the access rate shift. <clears throat> the best approach is a step down and phased out fund over time. The critical period will be the, the steps when moving from intrastate access rates down to interstate access rates. We envision a fund that would allow for recovery of a percentage of those displaced revenues after a limited end user increase with that recovery declining over a fixed period. The amount of the transition fund required will be dependent on the overall transition. The longer the transition period, the smaller the transition fund. And the greater the likelihood that companies like Frontier can continue to confidently invest in rural broadband deployment, therefore meeting both of the Commission's goals for reform. Again, thank you for allowing Frontier to be a part of today's panel. All set. Uh, Bob Quinn with AT&T. Uh, the recovery mechanism should be designed uh, in the context uh, and to promote the overall vision for universal service reform. Uh, we have to, in this country, move our universal service support mechanism and intercarrier compensation regimes um, from supporting voice services to support of broadband infrastructure in this country. And I think we have to recognize the point that John made that today the access charge regime uh, uh, comprises a significant portion of end user revenue or excuse me of revenues that are received um, by rural and mid-sized carriers in this country um, it, as part of that migration i think there are going to be two very critical points um, that uh, are going to serve really as the reality um, that we're going to have to deal with um, point one is that we're not going to replicate the existing access charge regime in this new world where the support mechanism is going to be designed to support broadband infrastructure. The second point is that reasonably comparable prices for broadband services in high cost areas are going to be higher than the price that we pay today for basic local exchange service. We're not going to have, in my view, a seven or an eight dollar local service rate in the broadband environment and we have to recognize that. Um, we have two principles for the recovery mechanism that are very important. 
The first is fiscal responsibility. And we, what we mean by that is that the recovery mechanism should not create a windfall. We should utilize benchmark rates along with slick increases and provide the providers flexibility to ensure that end users in high cost areas who have historically enjoyed very low rates bear a fair share of the burden of the broadband infrastructure in their areas. The recovery mechanism should also be sized to reflect reductions in lines and minutes where appropriate to ensure that service providers not recover more than they would have in the, area, in the absence of intercarrier compensation reform. The second principle that's very important is that this arm should be transitional. It should help us bridge the transition as we go from a voice supported environment to a broadband supported environment. Ultimately, when that transition is complete, the fund should go away and the Commission should also look in establishing the benchmark rates that I think are going to have to play a big part of this. They should also look at raising those rates over the course of the transition period. Uh, and with that, I'm out of time, so we'll just go to questions when it's time. Thanks. Um, this is Charles McKee with Sprint. Uh, appreciate the time today. From Sprint's perspective, the goal of intercarrier compensation reform needs to be creating an environment in which competitors can flourish and moving away from a system that has been designed primarily to funnel money away from new entrants and competitors to fund the incumbent local exchange carriers. In doing that, we understand that there is going to be areas in which there is high cost and that there's no need to be addressed. But to the greatest extent possible, we should be moving to a system in which carriers recover their costs from their own consumers. In doing that, businesses will have to recognize that technology and consumer expectations change, and business plans have to change to accommodate those changes in technology and expectation. It appears that the LECs, at least to date, have begun to address that, and in fact, the LECs have been aware for many years that these changes have been coming. Indeed, we've been waiting 15 years for these changes to be implemented, and it's no surprise that we're going to be moving to a new system. There are new revenue streams for LECs. There are uh, greater efficiencies in the current LEC networks, all of which should reduce the need for a revenue replacement mechanism. Nonetheless, we recognize that one may be necessary. It needs to be limited in size, however, and in duration, and should be based upon actual need and not simply a guarantee of a continued revenue stream at current levels. A revenue stream alone is not an indication of need. Accordingly, we're going to have to look at actual cost to determine the need for an access replacement mechanism. Ongoing subsidies have a cost to the marketplace. They reduce the possibility of competition, they prolong market distortions, and they defer the benefits of ICC reform to consumers. Accordingly, we feel it's important that the Commission move as quickly as possible to a system that does not subsidize competitors, but rather looks to the end user for its basic recovery system. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, once I'll repeat what all the other panelists have said all day is thank you very much to the Commission for uh, having us here on this panel. I especially want to thank uh, Commissioner McDowell this morning who uh, talked about how important the interests of consumers are in this whole process. And uh, I would note that apparently I'm the only representative of consumers on any of the panels today. So, um, and, and you talk, th there's a lot of talk about building consensus and it appears that there may be some consensus among the industry. Uh, but does it make me a Luddite to point some of these fundamental questions out? Uh, does it make me a heretic uh, not to have uh, drunk the Kool-Aid? I don't think so. But on behalf of those who pay for all of this and those who are supposed to benefit, uh, 
I feel it's my responsibility representing Nasuka to continue to ask these questions. And the questions include whether the reductions in intercarrier compensation are necessary and the question of whether recovery is necessary. Um, I'm going to continue, we are going to continue to point these fundamental questions out and point out the law where it's incon maybe inconvenient. And uh, to quote uh, that great savant Yogi Berra, this to, to us sometimes seems like it's deja vu of deja vu of deja vu all over again. Um, from the customer perspective, you can and should fix the traffic pumping and the phantom traffic issues, and you should also require intercarrier compensation for VoIP traffic. Um, those will have an impact on consumers, but eventually as they work themselves out. Uh, but the recovery mechanism obviously will have a direct impact on consumer. The uh, in proposed increases to the subscriber line charge, of course, not only go away from the original purpose of the slick, and, uh, but also burden low users. And of course, it's likely to drive more customers from wireline to wireless, which some of the members of this panel might be happy about. Um, but the, and changes in the USF, of course, spread that burden more widely. But in the end, what you're talking about is reducing these revenues. By, uh, and are we talking about reducing these revenues because the charges are going to be reduced below cost in order to create a subsidy in the true fall harbor sense of the word? Um, and, but if you put intercarrier compensation at its economic cost, that means that the revenues should be adequate. In the end, uh, flowing these dollars through the Universal Service Fund without examining the fundamentals of the statutory purpose of Universal Service is asking for the customers of other companies in other states to support the revenues of the carriers who are having their access revenues reduced, and we're going to continue to ask questions about that. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. My name is Frank Loud, and I'm with Raymond James. I'm an equity research analyst um, here. So, uh, just quick uh, disclosure up front none of the stocks that we've, the companies we talk about today, I do not own any, any shares of any of the stocks. Raymond James may have some business relationships with some of these companies. If you have any questions about that, you can feel free to, to, to see me later. But you know, with that said, uh, I'm, I'm sort of independent here. I, I cover uh, the Rural X, I cover AT&T and Verizon, Comcast, Time Warner Cable, the CLEX data centers. I pretty much cover this whole space. So uh, I, I, when I, and when I look at this, my, my, my job is to try and tell investors what I think about the space and where's the best place to invest, which from a public policy standpoint is something that it should be paid attention to because ultimately it's this investment in, this, in these networks that provides these services and without the investors and without the, the cash flow there, then you, you won't see that uh, over time and that becomes, you know, ultimately becomes uh, a part of a, a, becomes a problem. But, you know, I take one, you know, I've, I've heard a lot today, a lot of comments about the, the revenue side of this and, and how much revenue this is, the, the potentially looks at it. And, and when we look at the valuation from, from an investor standpoint, we look at the free cash flow which is basically a measure of, of your revenues, less your cost and reinvestment in the business to determine what's left for the, the shareholders. And, and when you look at that, the, 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 the intercarrier compensation, whichever flavor it is, and it to, in, in my opinion, I think Wall Street's opinion, universal service, access, the intercarrier comp, are pretty much all the same. When you get, to, when you get that, there's, there's a revenue aspect and a cost aspect as well. And the real impact is, is sort of the net impact, because if you were to take away that revenue, a substantial amount of cost would go away as well. And that's something that uh, that you know we've tried to educate our investors on um, quite a bit. It's not necessarily because it, some investors would look at some companies and say, if all this went to zero, oh no, there would be no free cash flow. There would be no more no more company. It's not necess not necessarily the case. Although you know it is clearly important. And the other thing that I think that is important um, is is come up also today that I think from a public policy standpoint. The commission and others need to, to look at is is the the what are what, whose ox is going to get gored here and somebody everyone is going to have to end up paying some higher cost and uh, including the end users 
and that that's not there's not really been a market rate for telecom services that the customers have ever paid and they don't understand that because this whole the whole in your care compensation system has really distorted the economics of the business and that's a public policy decision that uh, I think is is something that the Commission and the states are going to have to have to deal with the important thing is this really should be a very long transition in a very just very slowly and predictably put this in place because these businesses can take time to transition and with that you have time to sort of educate the customers but I think that's an important thing that I, I, I haven't heard discussed as much um, uh, in, the, in the past I'll turn it over to Rebecca thank you everyone I'll start it off both uh, David and Frank hit a little bit on the consumers and um, Previous intercarry compensation reform benefited consumers through lower long distance rates and more competition. Today with bundled service offering, how should we evaluate the potential benefits to consumers? Well, I, I guess the, you know, the fundamental question is the question that you just asked. And l lowering the long distance rates when so many customers now have bundled packages is probably not going to have that great an impact on the cost that customers pay for local for their long distance calling but on the other hand loading the uh, costs onto local rates by increasing the slick or by other rate increases is not going to help consumers so I'm not sure that there's been a, a, a definitive benefit to customers shown in any of this well in, in general I mean especially when you go back to the 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 calls order and the mag plan and so forth there were several step downs in rates and they weren't necessarily always passed on to consumers at least after a certain point they weren't uh, and and but I think there, your question about a bundling is really important because that's generally how most customers are buying services these days and you can talk about adding the slick and so forth these are all regulatory terms that that the customer doesn't really think about they know what they write how much of a check they write every month and that ends up being what's really important. And then if you look, if you really want to do a, make a proceeding correct, you need to look further down the road and where we're going. We're going to more of a broadband world. And eventually, both on the wireless side and the wireline side, you'll see, I think you'll see the industry charging by the amount of bandwidth you're using. And so a lot of this doesn't, is, uh, over time, um, doesn't become relevant. And there have been sort of the law of unintended consequences that have been talked about earlier today in other, in other panels, such as the uh, access pumping and so forth, that someone finds a way to get around it. I, it, when, I think it's very important as the Commission takes these steps to reform these things that they make sure that you look at where the world is going and, 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 and you don't put a policy in place that becomes outdated very quickly. Um, all of you mentioned sort of a transition and a, a sufficient transition time. I don't know, it would be helpful if we could go down the road to see what you suggest as a transition. I'm wondering if a long transition in Wall Street terms is maybe a different in the regulatory terms. Can we start with you, John? Um, yeah, we think in terms of maybe a five-year transition, but one of our issues is we rely much more on intercarry compensation than other carriers. Uh, you know, Frontier said 10%. We're, we're up at 30%. So we do need a significantly uh, period of transition to adjust to this. It, when you're saying five years, that's intra to inter or for the entire transition? Uh, I would think that'd be uh, uh, you go to inter to in, intra to inter first, then five years on top of that. Ken? We, we would be looking at about a, a four-year transition of the first step and then some period of time to go down to whatever the, the ultimate end rate would be. And, you know, John's five years sounds good to me. Uh. I'm going to give you some numbers. In 2006, when we finished the acquisition of Bell South, the combined company on a pro forma basis had over 37 million residential access lines. We just issued our annual report for year end 2010. Four years later, we have 22 and a half million residential access lines. Frank made the point that when revenues go away, costs go away. That's not how it works, right? Not in our environment, not the way that the regulatory environment works. Back in 2008, when we were in front of this commission, we filed a number of dials ex parties to talk about the access recovery mechanism. And I think we sized that arm at about $4.3 billion, given the fact that um, we were only talking about the terminating side of this issue. And in some of the preliminary analysis that we're doing today, um, we're looking out three years. So there's a five-year time frame. And the size of that arm looks like it's going to be just over $2 billion total. So when we talk about transitions, 
we're in a free fall and i don't think anybody can plan on having the kind of transition that's going to provide the absolute certainty because we're already way through this transition and if we don't do something very quickly um, there's going to not we're going to get to a point where there's not going to be a point to do anything at all because the numbers are in free fall so i would argue for you that our transition ought to be as short as we can possibly make it because technology and the market is transitioning this stuff today and it's not going to stop so i i joked when bob sat, sat down that <clears throat> they, they must have seated us next to each other in the hopes of conflict and <laughs> i find myself in the awkward position of almost immediately agreeing with bob on something <laughs> Um, that is awkward. It is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Almost embarrassing. Um, you know. You were for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I better stop now. Um, you know, a, as I said earlier, and and I think I think we need to recognize this uh, from another. So the comment was made about people moving to wireless. Well, that's right. People are moving to wireless. Um, they're not being forced to move to wireless. Wireless rates are not being subsidized. Um, people are choosing to move to wireless. They are choosing to leave their landline services and they're choosing a different service. Technology has fect effectively moved to a position where that's where consumers want to choose to use their services and that's what they're buying. So that's right, we are moving and, and it's not just wireless, of course, it's also broadband. Um, people are moving onto the net and they're using the net as their replacement for voice transmission. Um, that's a choice that's occurring today and has been happening very rapidly. As Bob points out, we have 280 million uh, wireless connections. We've got, uh, I keep losing track of where the number is on, on the landline, but it's been dropping dramatically and continues to do so. But, it's and a it, chart, it's a, a very nice one too. You should, you can, you should, should, you should have blown number. up or something. <laughs> What's our conclusion? Uh, but the, but the point being that the government is not going to be able to somehow stop that tidal wave of change. And, and the government's not going to be able to somehow slow that down and say, well, that's not where we want consumers to go. So uh, I'm, here's my, my point of embarrassing agreement. I agree with Bob. We need to do it as quickly as possible. And, and frankly, we just need to move to the point where we're actually trying to live in a competitive environment as much as we can recognizing that there's going to be some need for other cost recovery. Well, I, I guess from the customer's perspective, since we are likely to be impacted by whatever recovery mechanism is arrived at, I think we would prefer a longer perspective, a longer transition. And also, I think that the transition needs to be long enough so that this will work its way through the courts uh, as it inevitably will uh, so that before 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 the transition is over we will know whether what the commission did was legal or not um, and maybe we'll we'll never know that um, I, I would also point out one thing an interesting thing about the use of wireless versus wireline. Um, if you take the number of folks who are unemployed and underemployed in this economy, I think that the latest statistic on that is about 28 or 29 percent, which is coincidentally right around the number of folks who are wireless only. I'm not sure there's a causal connection, but it's something that needs to be looked at. I, I would argue from, from the investor standpoint that a rapid transition would not be a good thing from an investor standpoint or a public policy standpoint. The time frame is not really as important. As investors tend to, investors want more, just want more certainty. They want to know what the rules are. Is it going to be heavily regulated or not very heavily regulated? Just, just, just if once you make the decision, then investors can, can make their the valuations and investments appropriately. So if there, as long as there is a set plan and the time frame is, is known, that would be much better for investors. If it happens very quickly, you'll see investment dollars leave the space. That threatens capital in the space, threatens reinvestment, and threatens more broadband build out and, and, other, and other things. Once there's more certainty, I, I would argue that valuations, in, especially for rural X, are depressed because of uh, the uncertainty about what's going to happen 
with intercare compensation in USF and, and ultimately that any what sort of transitions might might happen. Um, there's, there's competitive threats as well, but that's a that's a big factor there. And if that if that issue were resolved, I think you could see valuations rise and you could see more investment in the space, which from a public policy standpoint is probably a good thing as well. And can you just clarify the term when you talk about Rolex? You're talking about I'm talking about. Um, I'm generally thinking of the public companies as we as mentioned earlier this this morning. But I um, uh, but the the rural any anyone someone that's not an Arbok. So the uh, Windstream, I guess Century would now be in the. Arbok category, Windstream, uh, Otelco, Consolidated Communications, Alaska Communications, those, those other companies. As a follow-up, uh, you know, our members realize that broadband is the future. We, we realize that uh, voice-only PSTN landlines are under decline. The transition for us enables us to make that change and doesn't disrupt the customer. We are building and working as hard as we can to get broadband and the comparisons that both AT&T Sprint made were more or less PS10 to wireless. Our, our look at this is we're transitioning from voice only landlines to high speed internet as fast as we can because we know that's the business of the future. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to uh, push on uh, what revenues means when we're talking about developing a recovery me uh, mechanism and ask uh, for some views on which revenues should be considered. We could consider just regulated revenues. We might add some or all unregulated revenues. We could consider uh, revenues from affiliates as well. A uh, and uh, just to sh sharpen it a little bit, in, in the original, in your uh, earlier remarks uh, uh, a few moments ago, uh, I think I heard both Mr. Bergman and Mr. Lalvin uh, say they think about the issues uh, on the table here based on the financial situation of the enterprise as a whole. So does that push us to thinking about all revenues in developing a recovery mechanism? Or is there a case for uh, limiting the universe of revenues that we would consider? And it's really for all of you who would like to answer. Well, my, my answer would be I think we should look at uh, regulated revenues. Uh, that's uh, for intercarry compensation in both state and interstate. As far as uh, unregulated revenues, our guys in the video, since we pay significantly more for content uh, than some of the larger MSOs, I mean, our, our video stuff is barely making it. And we have, uh, I would say it may be as much as 40 or 50 percent of our companies are losing money on video. So if you're going to have that type of revenues, you need the cost to go with it or have a net revenue. Because, um, I mean, we're struggling with video. And I would say Frontier's opinion is, is very much the same. When, when we look at replacement, we, we are looking at the switched access world or, or the revenues related to, to intercarrier compensation, both at the state and, and, and federal level. And that's really how, when we look at it internally, even how we're sizing, what we see is the, is the potential risk and, and kind of determining how we think we would need to move through this, whether it's replacing through a fund, replacing through an end user, or having a transition long enough that we can actually limit how much of that we need to do. I was just referring to the uh, switch to access revenues. That's all, I all we were trying to size back in 2008 was what is the implicit subsidy that's built into switch access and where is that going. So that's what my references were, were simply to the regulated intercarrier revenues. Well, with respect to revenues, it seems to be the question of what's the goal here of the transition? Um, simply making carriers whole would seem to undermine the idea of a reform. Um, and the question is, well, what revenues need to be replaced? There's an assumption, I think, that all revenues must be replaced because they're somehow needed. I think there needs to be a demonstration of need. So our starting point is not to look at revenues no surprise. Our starting point is to look at well, what is the cost. Um, but certainly if you're going to look at revenues, you need to look at all the revenues that are being recovered off of the plant that's being subsidized. So if you have a situation where you have a benchmark of, let's say you have a benchmark of $20, um, and in a high cost area, the LEC says that, well, my cost of that loop is $27. Um, but they're selling services and getting ARPU off of that loop of 120 by selling additional services on the same loop. You know, does it make sense to then say, well, but we need to pay them an additional seven dollars? 
um, there needs to be rationality to what revenue means, actual need for that revenue, and then a structure for how that's going to be addressed. In this instance, I agree with Charles. Um, the, I think to use the metaphor that was current uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the question is what are the spigots out of which the dollars flow? Or I think it was AT&T that talked about dials. And they, I I'm, hope I'm rem right, remembering this right. There were only three dials in their analysis. And of course, there are far more than that. So if you are talking about replacing revenues, you do need to consider all the sources of revenue that the company is making. And if a small company is losing its shirt on video, then they won't have the revenues to, to be considered, and they will still need support. I, I, I would agree. I mean, look, this gets back to my earlier comment. We've got all these regulatory divisions on, on the customer's bill and all these sort of arbitrary things that the customers don't necessarily understand. And then if you look at uh, what, is this, what is all this network providing, and I, I, I listen to hearings and I see things, and sort of the elephant always in the room is, you're, talk, you're talking about where we're going to bring support to support broadband. The elephant, how do you think this stuff was built? I mean, where, where did, how did DSL get built originally? If, if these companies weren't profitable because of the, the, the revenue recovery, they, they never would have been able to build DSL to begin with. And now we have, from what I hear from the administrations, they have a policy of pushing more broadband out to rural areas. And here you have companies that have, have demonstrated for 100 years in some cases that they want to serve these customers. Uh, if you need, really need to look at it in, in, in aggregate. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's, that's just important because that's uh, moving it to support broadband and support all the services that these, these networks are providing that the customers want, that's really the only way to look at it. Now, I think the danger and the concern that some of the industry is saying, oh, no, well, that would get us down to being regulated, you know, regulating even more parts of the, of the industry. I think that it, the, the regulatory bodies need to look at this and say, what, what service are they providing? Can we just let these companies operate? not be so concerned about whether they're, you know, let them make some money and then they can reinvest it and, and, uh, and provide even more services because ultimately you do have competition in certain parts of your network and if you don't reinvest and make more and add more services, then you'll be in trouble such as the, the video side of things that, that uh, they were talking about from Opasco. Uh, yes, hello. I have a question. Uh, that pertains to the end state or the long-term uh, reform and as it applies to might apply to rate of return carriers so uh, just assuming that in the future uh, in a future order we uh, the Commission adopts some of the proposals in the NPRM that set uh, interstate and possibly intrastate access prices on a path toward to cost based or perhaps bill and keep uh, then clearly they will not be no longer be determined according to rate of return principles. So I have two questions. Uh, first, to what extent um, after the transition is complete, will there be a need for a uh, re recovery mechanism, uh, presumably a cost-based or a recovery mechanism? And second, I if so, uh, to what extent or how can that be determined or should it be determined by incentive principles of incentive regulation or if not um, how sh what else might apply and I, I guess John should address this first but others are of course welcome uh, the end game to me would be pretty much an all broadband network and we think the Commission is looking at the Universal Service Fund the CAF and everything to transition to that world and that we we plan on uh, that we would be uh, rate of return regulated. We would need the CAF support to get the broadband out to keep up with the speeds that we know are going to be necessary to compete in this world. So, I mean, we think it's going to transition to an all broadband world. The, the uh, restructure mechanism for intercarry comp, I think, over time would go away. But we would hope that we have enough universal service funds so that we can provide broadband at the same rates and offer the same services and speeds as the rest of the country per the 96 Act. And we, we understand that uh, rate of return is, is, is a way of doing that, and we prefer that way over some price cap mechanism. And John, I think Bill was talking about just a switch to access revenue requirement, not sort of the common line or special access, because if you don't have an intercarrier rate, sort of how do you have a rate of return 
Well, I, I mean, I, that would transition down to zero then with no rate of return. I mean, I, I'm assuming that at the end game we're talking about that we wouldn't have a PSTN, that it would be all broadband, and we wouldn't have a, 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 a rate for uh, switched access, and we wouldn't have any cost either. But the, the, the carriers, the small carriers, would still be made whole in some sense, in your, in your view, by, by rate of return. Right, and we would hope that the, the future USF mechanism would be good enough that we can actually provide the broadband at the speeds our customers want and the prices they can pay. All right, so others want to comment? Well, I, I agree with John that the end state here is going to be a broadband world. And I, I, I think that's what the Commission's goal is with the National Broadband Plan. And I think if you make the assumption that there is no intercarrier compensation in that world, there's no access charge regime that operates in that world, then, then that perspective, all of that money goes. And then I think you've got to look at what are the revenue streams that are going to be available to the, to the entity that's providing broadband service. And I, I, I think today John gave a good breakdown of it. It's, you know, 30 percent uh, from the uh, end user. 40% from universal service, 30% from intercarrier compensation in order to be able to, to provide the cost of providing voice services. In a broadband world, I think the two sources of funding are going to be um, via the end user and via some contribution from universal service where broadband would not exist but for the, the, the use of universal service dollars to be able to provide broadband services. I don't know what that world looks like. I don't if, if it if it turns out to be rate of return um, for some carriers in that environment. It's not going to look like rate of return today. But I think what you're going to be trying to do is you're going to be trying to establish a regime whereby the end user is contributing a fair portion of the cost of providing that service, and the balance comes from the universal service fund. And and by focusing on efficient technologies, I think you're going to be able to provide some form of discipline to that. Uh, at the end of the day so that the consumers are contributing and we're going to try and be as efficient as we can with the limited universal service dollars that we have to be able to provide service on comparably uh, reasonable rates throughout the country and speeds throughout the country as John pointed out. Thank you. I, I would throw one more thing in there. I mean, when I, I read a lot recently about uh, rate of return regulation <coughs> seem to be vilified because it's come to people's attention that it's not very efficient. But when you look at this, the, the, there's one factor here that's really changed. Rate of return, in my simple analysis, was a business arrangement between regulators and the companies. We'll give you a monopoly, but in exchange, we're going to kind of limit how much you, money you make, and we're going to require you to build everybody. And so you get to build everybody, and it's since a very good plant. But now you've incented, put, brought competition into the mix, and that wasn't the case before. And so I think, you know, moving to an incentive-based regulation is, is probably something that's palatable, but there have to be some offsets for the competition that's there, whether you're going to continue to require the, the, the carrier of last resort obligations and so forth if you're moving to uh, a more incentive regulation, more actual cost-based, and then more actual, you know, cost-based uh, uh, revenue that you're charging the end user. And I think that's, that's one aspect. Of, if you're, if you're going to start messing around with rate of return, that aspect, the, the competition um, factor has to be considered. Let me just add, uh, from the state perspective, of course, I, I, I think the reference, uh, references to rate of return regulation are, have largely been on the interstate side, because on the state level, of course, very few carriers remain regulated under rate of return regulation. In my state of Ohio, um, by law that was passed last year, um, nobody's under rate of return regulation, so they're entitled to set all, all but basic service rates at any level they want, and they're entitled to earn as much as they want. And in fact, you know, while r what rate of return regulation from the customer's perspective was, was a guarantee of a minimum level of revenue, there have very, very seldom been any high-end adjustments on the state level on, for rate of return carriers. David and Frank make, make an interesting point. I think you really have to kind of put their two thoughts together. You know, in the old days, in a rate of return environment, 
100 percent of the customers or virtually 100 percent i think we, we achieved north of 99 percent penetration on voice services subscribe to one carrier service you know when i look out at the world tomorrow i'm going to tell you that a third of the customers are going to choose a wireless only option and i know that there are a whole lot of people out there who'll tell you that wireless isn't isn't the be all end all you can't do what you can do on wireline i heard that in the net neutrality debates at this commission but that's not the reality wireless is going to be a very viable service and a third of the customers are going to choose a wireless only option and if there's a cable company president a third of the customers <coughs> will choose the cable competitor and a third of the customers may choose an incumbent provider of wireline broadband services. Rate of return regulation had two components, and while David points out on the, on the rate side, on the, the return side, all of those regulatory obligations are gone, but the Kohler obligations and all of the legacy regulatory responsibilities are there. So in that environment I described, where, where I've got three customers and each chooses a different broadband delivery mechanism for them, that local incumbent, if something's not done, still has to maintain all three loop infrastructures, even though two of those customers are never going to be there. And that's when, when, when I think John talks about rate of return, I think that's one of the critical aspects that underlies his analysis of why it's so important. And I think to Frank's point, it also underscores how difficult that concept is going to be to address. We have to deal with the underlying regulatory environment that's there, um, or none of this is going to work. Well, is, the issue becomes, is there a reason why you continue to subsidize when you've got two alternative providers who are, in fact, providing service to those customers? So is the question then going to be needing to look more carefully at how those dollars are being spent and whether or not they, in fact, are being spent wisely? I think, though, the point that was made earlier is an important one, and that is the reality is rate of return is a very small portion of what the total universe of lines is. Um, I think Verizon, AT&T hold roughly 77% of all ILEC lines, and if you put in uh, the new Century Link uh, that pushes up to 90% of ILEC lines. So, um, you know, for those smaller carriers, it may be reasonable to have a different transition path. Um, you know, that that maybe that's a more difficult issue to resolve, but. Um, I still think we need to address the bulk of the stuff now, and, and those are really the big carriers. I guess I'd, I'd like to answer the question a little bit differently and probably a little bit self-serving. Um, Frontier is predominantly a price cap carrier, yet it finds itself in a u unique position, particularly with some of the concepts laid out in the NPRM, that companies that have made explicit commitments as part of transactions to deploy broadband are not eligible for the CAF until they meet those commitments. And, and so that a, a new fund that's established for broadband would not be available at potentially the same time we would have revenues moving very rapidly if Charles has his way, um, would, would, would obviously make it much more challenging for us to meet those commitments than were contemplated when they were agreed to. I'm not sure that's a fair, I mean, in terms of the eligibility, you might not be eligible for the areas that you committed, but I think you would be eligible for other areas to compete. I think, and, and if that's the interpretation, I guess that's fine, but the way we had read it was we needed to meet those commitments first. No, could I clarify? Sure. Uh, what we were trying to say was that uh, we were not going to use universal service going forward to pay for commitments that were made prior to the reforms. So. Whatever you committed to, you need to do. But if you're going to get right, universal I, services, it's got to go beyond. So I, I think the I think the that's result I think the result is the same result as what I'm saying, it which is doesn't mean you have to complete everything before you could consider um, getting capital. Okay, but but the result is still the same result that I'm that I'm speaking to, which is we we we, we can only use CAF then. Let's just say for the last 15 percent of an area that we hadn't committed to, and yet potentially have our revenues and cash flows dramatically changed to try to meet the jump from X percent to the 85 percent over that. And that's where, uh, on a transitionary basis, we think uh, some access recovery mechanism becomes critical for us. And so it's a little different spin than a rate of return spin, but one why we think it's important. Kevin. My question was picking back up on the, the uh, issue of revenue replacement for those carriers that are at, were advocating for switched access or regulated revenue replacement. 
Um, I'd like to get a response to Frank's original point that was at the very least shouldn't you factor in uh, your intercarrier expenses that you pay to other carriers as well as operational savings that reform offers in terms of uh, lower billing collections and litigation expense in terms of what you need to be uh, measured on uh, for the loss from frontiers perspective I, I think the conceptually looking at what we're paying on for for wholesale long-distance traffic and the savings that potentially can come along from that I, I don't think that's unreasonable is there a guarantee from the IXCs that we're going to see that pass through on the wholesale side um, you know I, I think the point being is there's no guarantee in the contracts that we have we would have to go back and renegotiate those to see those savings but it doesn't it doesn't have to do with what the IXCs are going to say because I, 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 I never see that but you there is a certain margin in your G&A line and the, for all the carriers that you're paying for access when you call interstate you're you're getting four cents a minute for originating or whatever it is well, and, but in a lot of and cases we're, we're paying a rate to to the wholesale provider and and it may be a combined originating transport terminating rate that's that's a fixed rate so for that state this is your rate for this state this but is if, your rate and if, if you unify all the rates or if they go down you would have a you there will be some element of your cost that would also go down at, to this at the same time I think, uh, and the yes. net effect of that may may be large it may not be I would I would argue that yours probably isn't is, you're probably a net receiver of access on and on the margin uh, John's customers are probably very very large net receivers AT&T and Sprinter net payers and and, 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 and you're right and all, all I was trying to say is there's a piece of that savings that we would have to negotiate before we saw the savings that it's not a guaranteed pass through let, let me answer you but just talk, that's a timing issue right if you, a yes. lot of your contracts probably have it written in there that there is a pass through of, of cost savings that your IXCs realize on access if not when you have new IXCs come in and compete for your business once the rates are lower at better rates very very very, very possible and likely yes yeah, but here's the reality and the reality is is that access charges get paid in the long distance market right long distance carriers are paying the access charges so when 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 sprints access charges go down and that cost goes down and my access charges go down as an LD provider that's going to drive the rates of long distance services down it just is because that's the competitive market but the access revenues are coming to the long distance services side of the industry they're coming to support the local infrastructure so you're talking about two completely different revenue streams you're not replacing the local the, the revenues on the local side to support the local infrastructure what's going to happen when you take the access charges out of LD rates they're going to go down further not a thriving business by the way right I mean when we were talking about access with David 10 years ago um, a little bit different business than it currently is today but what you're talking about now is you're talking about saying okay access charges come down the competitive model of long distance and believe me that's very very competitive my kids don't use long distance they use Skype right they're on Skype video they're on Skype long distance so that's a very very competitive market and it's a very competitive model you take costs out of that service segment and the rates in there are going to go down but that's not going to replace the revenue on the on the local infrastructure side of the house it just isn't and you're just taking money out of the system from the local part of the house that needs the infra that needs the support to support the local infrastructure. Uh, to address your issue, one of the reasons we, we said we have a benchmark right is to make sure we get up to that amount from our customer. And so that would be a net offset. Uh, the other thing is that we think to, to the extent that fixing uh, phantom traffic and also uh, uh, including uh, BOIP as, as telecom service, we think that might increase some. And we fully expect that would net out against uh, what's in the restructure mechanism too. We will never, we, w we understand the idea is if you fix these things, that that restructuring mechanism would be lower and have less pressure on the universal service fund. So we were, we were looking at a net amount. So um, I actually have two questions. Um, the first question comes from one of our web participants, and the second question has several parts, so um, feel free to take notes. <laughs> the first question from the web participant was, with today's integrated local and long-distance companies and with competition from wireless and VoIP, why have a slick at all? 
And the second question is, um, in the event that SLICs should play a role in the recovery of reduced ICC rates, what are the relative merits of using a level increase in SLIC rates, using SLIC rate caps that are tailored to some level of network usage, like a variable SLIC, and how would that work given the popularity of bundled offerings or some sort of restructuring of the SLICs in some other manner? Well, many CLICs don't have SLICs, right? Many CLICs and wireless companies don't have SLICs, but they don't have their local rates regulated. I think if we remove the regulation and you provide the, the certain amount of flexibility, I don't really care what bucket it falls into, but you have to provide the flexibility to the carrier to be able to recover the lost revenue or the cost of providing the service. But Bob, in some states you don't, the local rates aren't rate regulated, so do you suggest, what do you suggest happens in those states? Because there are some states, I think Iowa's one, where the local rates aren't regulated by the state. I, I, I think to be fair, I, I'm, I don't provide service in Iowa, right? But to be fair, if, if the local rates aren't regulated, as long as you have the flexibility to re recover it, that's all you can ask for as a carrier. I mean, just to be perfectly honest, um, I think that's really all you can ask for. But that's, that's going to be the exception, not the rule. I, I, would, I would say that if, of, of course we don't need a slick. I mean, think about what we're talking. We're calling it the slick. There's a reason for that, okay? This is, this is, this is what you, the customer pays. I don't know of any carrier that, that has the, the opportunity to charge the full slick that chooses to only charge a dollar. They all charge the full 650 or 920. It's part of the local rate. And it makes customers feel better because it makes it look like they're paying their, their, their regulated rate looks really small and looks, you know, 30% smaller than what it is if they were only paying that line. But let's just let's call it what it is. It's the local rate. Put it in the local rate and let cust and 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 then get and if you could get rid of the local rate regulation. I mean, look again. The CLEX don't have a slick. Why? Look what the cable company charges. They charge about thirty-ish dollars, and because that's kind of what the market will bear. Everyone sh and, and it just puts the telcos at a disadvantage. We we could go back to what the slick was when it was first introduced, which of course was the interstate portion of the local loop, but of course that uh, idea was abandoned a long time ago. So uh, in the Missoula plan, and let's call it the Martin plan for, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, the, the SLIC was just another revenue recovery mechanism. And if, if, I hope I'm remembering this right, but in the, for instance, in the Missoula plan, the idea was that in Washington DC right here uh, the slick would go up to ten dollars now probably the lowest cost place in the whole country but that interstate portion was supposed to go up to ten dollars as it would everywhere else and so I guess that that's my answer to that question if there are going to be increases in subscriber line charges they need to be based on cost not just across the board Slick is a federal. It's in the federal jurisdiction, a federal uh, uh, charge, and the local rates in the states. And, uh, and and I agree with you, Frank, that it's essentially a local. The customer sees it as a local rate, but they are in two different district, uh, di um, two different jurisdictions. Sorry, I forgot the second question. <laughs> <laughs> if if the slicks should play a role in some sort of recovery mechanism, what should that look like? Should it be sort of a across the board should it be what about the concept of sort of a, a variable slick or some sort of some other kind of restructuring just raise rates <laughs> let the rates come up more to what's a, what, what is more of a market rate and where there's competition that rate those rates will not go up and where there's not then maybe it needs to because the customers are, are not recovering the full cost and we've you know we've made customers feel good by giving them a fourteen dollar bill then we nickel and dime them in a bunch of other places to really recover the cost and eventually it's all kind of collected but the customer doesn't see that. Again, it's kind of the can of worms that the, the, rec the, the industry has kind of made for themselves over the last 50 years. But that it ultimately, rates are going have to have to go up for, for some case, for really for on everybody. But it just, it's, there's going to be some shock for, for a certain part of the market. I mean, it may be true that today most carriers charge the full slick. Not all do. And, of course, you don't have to f charge the whole slick. The, the point is if you set the slick too low, then... Yes, then you automatically just tack it on, and it just becomes a part of the local rate. If you give enough flexibility in the slick, then you can allow the market to have more influence. Um, 
I want to ask uh, if the carriers have any particular experience in an interstate access reform and developing a recovery mechanism that maybe the FCC should look at. Uh, any sort of lessons learned from state interstate access reform? <coughs> I'll start. I'm just Ken. <laughs> Well, and, and it's, a, it's a tough question to answer because we've, we've seen multiple states do various types of reform, right? We've had some that have gone and, and put state universal service funds in place. We've had some that have done longer transitions with, with very measured um, local, and local rate increases. Um, and we've seen combinations of both. Um, so it, it's, it's hard to say which works best, but I think the principles that we talked about earlier are the same principles that we talk about in, in looking at interstate access reform, that it, everything be measured, that the transition be reasonable so that there's not a significant increase in any one step on the end user. And, you know, part of that is obviously you don't want sticker shock on your customers, but I think as we talked about access line losses in our industry, anything that's significant and create shock also potentially the put, you know raises the risk that the revenue that you're trying to replace you're ultimately going to lose through an increase in access line losses I think the lesson that we learned is do it all at once fast because otherwise my son will be here in 10 years talking about all this <laughs> I mean I guess the good news from the states is that you already have a lot of states that have already taken most many of the steps if not most of the steps that the Commission's proposing and disaster has not befallen them. So, uh, you know, maybe that's just an encouragement that we can move a little faster. I, I think a number of the states have, have a universal service fund um, that have accomplished some of this in the past. And I think it, it would be a good idea for the FCC to look at those to see how they've worked and not do anything that would upset what some of the states have already done. Because our, our members do uh, depend on some of those uh, state universal service funds for the for the lowering of those access rates in the state. I, I think one there was a NRI paper I think, well, last year or the year before that that evaluated the state universal service funds, and some of those universal service funds were actually high cost funds intended to. Uh, make it easier for carriers to provide service in high cost areas. Others of them, though they're called universal service funds, were actually revenue replacement funds. And uh, that's what we're, uh, is currently being litigated in my state of Ohio. Um, so I think we, we need to make a, a clear distinction between a state high cost fund, which is what the federal high cost fund is currently supposed to be, uh, and, and state revenue replacement funds, which is unfortunately what a lot, a lot of the funds actually are. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, I, can you hear me? Okay. I'd be happy to share with you the Iowa process. Um, we're struggling, so I don't know how informative it will be. Uh, but a couple of years ago, the board did undertake some intrastate access reform. Um, and it was brought to us uh, via the complaint process. And in Iowa, we have several rural carriers, upwards of 200, and, and together they serve about 225 calling areas. And these carriers join together under the association tariff and the I ITA, Iowa Telecommunications Association. Well, the record showed in that proceeding that the average ITA member retail rates were unreasonably low while their switched access rates were unreasonably high. Um, to give you an idea of how low the local rates were, um, of these 225 calling areas, 197 of those areas offered service below the national average of $15.03, 211 below Quest Iowa urban rates of $16.60, and 77 of those calling, ar calling areas were below $10 a month. Um, on top of that, we found that the access rates charged were unreasonable. We had um, asked for support for the access rates. Uh, ITA responded that we mirror the NECA rates, or that they rec uh, mirror the NECA rates. Uh, in truth, that was not the case. Um, there had been some, some reforms, and, and I'll, I'll throw out the, the tra uh, transport interconnection charge as an example, the, the tick charge. 
despite the fact that a lot of those costs had been reallocated to other rate elements, the ITA was still charging that. Also, a lot of those um, that the services recovered under that charge, such as tandem switching, or um, were were performed by someone completely other than these ITA companies. They're performed by a group called INS. So what we found was that that the access rates were not cost-based and we didn't have to have this discussion in Iowa should we do revenue replacement or cost replacement because by statute we have to move charges to cost and we also have to make decisions in a um, that promote competition so we needed to move those rates down to cost and we and we lowered those to the NECA rates um, with one exception, by rule, we still charge a three, three cent CCL and we can't waive our own rules. So all of this is a really long way of saying we've started, started this process. What we told our companies is if you still can't recover your cost, bring a proceeding to the board. We have had a test case where a rural carrier said we can't recover our cost under the board's new rates. And it has opened up a whole new set of issues for the board on what are cost. Because we were surprised to learn when they submitted these embedded separation cost studies that their ver version of cost is not necessarily the cost of access. It's the cost, again, to, to run their company. And I can't go into the details because a lot of them are confidential. But suffice it to say, in general, we found that there were cost or inputs in these separation studies that uh, related to the non-regulated side of the company, uh, that related to, um, I, again, I, I, I don't want to get into confidential information, but th things that didn't have a lot to do with, with providing interstate access, or phone service for that matter. So, so what we're, so all of this is a long way of saying we don't have a state USF yet. We're, we're looking at it. But we foresee the same problem in coming up with a state USF that we have in trying to set these access rates and that we don't have a good idea what the costs are to serve these rural, rural areas. Despite asking for information, we have not received it. Um, on, on the access cases, we tend to get data on the regulated piece and the only part we regulate is the um, uh, the, the <coughs> interstate access but we don't know what the revenues are from the non-regulated pieces and we don't know what the costs are to serve and something else that came up when we looked at these inputs what troubled us on these separation studies is there does not seem to be any sort of prudency review on these uh, on cost or expenditures they're just automatically thrown into these into these studies and so um, I, if I could turn my response to you Rebecca into a question for the panelist I'd be really interested as we move forward in talking about recovery whether if it's USF, uh, federal USF or the, the Connect America Fund or, or state USF um, who is, reviewing, who is reviewing the prudency of these costs? If we're talking about you know, ratepayer money, how do we know that these companies, that, that the costs are necessary, that they're efficient? Um, you know, I know that some of our carriers in Iowa do band together for efficiencies of scale, but I don't know to what extent. And um, so, you know, I, I guess in summary, our, our lesson from Iowa is that we still have no idea what it costs to serve these areas and and this is after several contested cases and going forward as we're regulated less and on, on the broadband piece certainly states have less of a regulatory presence there how, how do we how do the regulators whether it be a state or federal level know that these costs that carriers want to recover are prudent that's an, that's an excellent, excellent point. I, I would love to be able to highlight and score that in the transcript <laughs> uh, after, after you said it. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, you know, from our perspective, the, none of these rates are related to cost. Um, the, the actual incremental cost of providing these services is small, very low. And in fact, it's been going down steadily 
and with IP technology, it's reducing even further. So I agree with you 100%. There needs to be some kind of reality check and close scrutiny of what these costs are and whether or not there really is need or is this just preserving a profit stream? I think we got to take a step up here because respectfully, if the Iowa Commission doesn't understand the costs of the carriers um, in providing access services, the FCC isn't going to be able to do that either. And just from a resource perspective, I, we're, we're fighting a battle that to me is, is already lost. We got to bring it up and focus on moving to a broadband fund where you're supporting broadband and trying to, trying to get it, not trying to determine what switched access costs are. I mean, because the reality is in 10 years, I'll be amazed if in 10 years, there will be some portions of the PSTN still around in 10 years, but there won't be many. And if, and if the FCC has, you know, really effectuated its national broadband plan goals, we're going to be dealing with a broadband environment that, that is going to be fundamentally different. And I think as you see next generation technologies come to fore in terms of providing broadband, I think it's going to give you the opportunity to get out of the business of trying to determine at some minute level of detail what the appropriate costs are. I mean, Joel, Joel Lubin, and I have been talking about, we, we used to talk about access costs all the time, right? But that day is so far beyond us, and if we, if we stay mired in, in trying to figure out what happened 10 years ago, we're never going to get to where we need to be in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I, I respect the effort. Um, you know, we don't have local infrastructure in Iowa. Um, we're a long distance provider there. I, I absolutely respect the effort. But the reality is, is the PSTN is going away and all of those issues are embedded in the PSTN. And if we haven't figured them out yet, we ought to, we, we just got to, we got to create a proper infrastructure <coughs> that supports broadband, that's disciplined by efficient technologies. We got to get out of the business of subsidizing competition and really trying to address the real issues of what the cost of providing broadband in rural America is going to be. I, I, I mean, Chris, you've got an unenviable position with the number of carriers you have in your state, but it is unusual. And if you back Windstream out of that couple hundred thousand lines, you're, I mean, they the said this morning, let's not let the, you know, the perfect be the enemy of the good. Unfortunately, it leaves you in a worse position, but we're talking about a relatively small, these little tiny lacks that maybe are putting one over people and are making massive profits. There, there's just not that many of them. And in the grand scheme of what else we could, we could do with the, for the industry that could bring some more certainty and move forward, there's probably some other policy decisions. And if a couple of guys get through the cracks, then it is what it is. That doesn't change your directive, I understand, but there, there's a, you know, if you look at it, as you're saying, from a big picture, there's, there, there's a lot more out here that needs to be addressed. Hey, Frank, I got a question for you, which is, how is putting the right framework in place going to help solve? I mean, to me, I look at Iowa, and we've got 200 carriers in Iowa, and i got to say that at some level, the word consolidation comes to mind, <laughs> that we do we really need 200 carriers in Iowa? I mean, I, but we've got to create a framework, I would think, that's going to that's gonna maybe do something to address that issue. Well, this, I mean, is creating an appropriate framework for broadband going to get us to an area where we have a more manageable number of carriers? Well, from, from what I see with the smaller carriers, they're generally family-owned. This gets to a very emotional issue. Mm -hmm. It's a family-owned business. Great-grandfather founded the business. They don't want to give it up. This is what it is. Yeah. Now, you make some changes that squeeze the business model, and that will force some of them to, to, to change. They'll have no choice. There definitely should be consolidation. There's n no reason for them to be that many carriers, no reason for them to be as many carriers as there, you know, besides that. But uh, it's it, when you, you have a, a family-owned business, it's just harder to, harder to force that, that kind of consolidation. I know Andy has a question, uh, and we only have about 10 minutes left. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, can I follow question? up real quick? I, I agree with you. I don't think we should spend a lot of time figuring out the proper intercarrier compensation rates. I mean, if the, I, I think they're going down, and that will be a moot point eventually. But my, my point is, is the lack of data. And there will likely be 
a recovery mechanism. It probably won't be intercarrier compensation, but it might be a state USF. And there is a there is a big problem at the state level, I don't know about the federal level, in getting the appropriate amount of data from the carriers to justify these costs. And how do we determine the appropriate recovery mechanism, if there is one, without without any kind of data? Uh, if you put a low number out there, you might get some data. One, one of the, <laughs> a, there's a, about 140 companies in Iowa, and a good chunk of them, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe half of them, are on what's called average schedules. And that is a, a, a somewhat of an incentive mechanism. And they don't do the separation cost studies. And their uh, return on access is based on formulas developed by NECA. So those guys probably don't have the data that you're looking for. And they're not on a cost basis. Uh, they're on, on an average schedule basis. And I'm not so sure whether it'd be worthwhile to push all that to, uh, to get a really cost-based separate between state and interstate and all that. But I, I would think the majority of those 140 companies in Iowa are on average schedules. And that's a different way of looking at things. Can I, can I really didn't have a question. I just wanted to make a point, and that is when I heard Commissioner Tanner talk about the experience of tr obtaining the information to understand what it is that you're replacing, to me it's a lesson for all of us to be learning. And that is every day, it seems, while I'm here at the office, someone is coming to me and saying, but we're going to need money for broadband build out. And the lesson that you've now had, well, how much money do they really need? And is it really being prudently spent is an important one. Because we do have a limited fund. We have a commitment not to grow the fund. And um, it's going to be a difficult task for all of us. But I think one that we need to listen very closely, go back to the transcript that's highlighted and underlined that Charles is going to have of what you had to say. Because I think it's an important thing for all of us to be thinking about. We only have about 10 minutes left. Peter, did you have a question you'd like to ask? Yeah, I guess maybe it one follows up a little bit on this point. But let me ask what maybe is a more um, threshold question. My, my sense is that some of you guys are doing what you are doing because you're competing. You're competing against other providers. And I know that, you know, competition is, is everywhere. In, in, in Iowa, there apparently is enough competition to have the legislature relax uh, end user rates. In, in New York, uh, we have long understood that there's a lot of competitive pressures such that 90 plus percent of the state, including a lot of rural areas, have uh, at least three platforms. So I guess there's a lot of competition out there, and I know that this reform is going to be painful, but the question I, I guess I want to ask is, should competitive carriers be allowed to get a contribution to supplement its cost recovery? And I guess with that question, I'm sort of assuming that there is increased flexibility on your end user rates. So if you have increased flexibility on your end user rates and your access charges are being reformed, are you saying that you have a claim for recovery from USF? I don't see a business case for a competitive carrier to go into some place where the revenue is so low that it requires a subsidy unless the carrier sees that subsidy is, as making it massively more profitable and going somewhere else. So I would say there's an arbitrage that's going on there just by definition. That would be my simple analysis, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, from Sprint's perspective, if you've got competition in there, to your point, wh why are you doing subsidies at all? Um, so if you've got multiple carriers and you have new entrants who've come in, built out plant, and are providing services, and they're doing that without a subsidy, then why do we need the subsidies in that area? Um, the issue becomes one of the ability of competition to then enter. So if you've got one player in the market who's receiving government subsidy, and then they therefore have a built-in price advantage over all new competitors or all new entrants, that's going to suppress competition in that market. So the, the question is, how do you deal with the issue of 
encouraging new entry. You can either do it by saying no subsidy for anybody or everybody gets the same subsidy. You know, frankly, we're more than happy to say, yeah, let's just eliminate the subsidy and let people compete. I, I, I would argue that's not exactly, that would only be the case if the co competition came into 100% of the territory. And that's not what I see. I see a highly profitable area of a small town and a comp competitor comes and take that, but then you've got the, the family farmhouse down the road. They, they, don't, they don't bother to go to that one. So if, if the competition was going to 100%, and you've got to remember that highly profitable center of town is subsidizing the vastly unprofitable other parts of the network, and it gets imbalanced. And then the issue becomes, and then how are you going to deal with subsidy for that area? So shouldn't your subsidy be directed towards that area and not directed towards that more profitable part of town? But the subsidy is determined today based on the average costs that average out both the, uh, both the competitive areas and the non-competitive areas. And you have to target that subsidy. I mean, you could cut the subsidy out from the town, but that just means that the cost of serving the farm may be even higher than what certainly higher, per maybe even perhaps the, uh, than the average between the town and the farm if the study area is large enough. So it's, I mean, there's, there's not an easy solution to that problem. I think you have to deal with the donut and the donut hole, and, and, and you're going to have to determine, you know, in, in, the, in the town, if, 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 if you went and completely disaggregated, um, in the town, it may be that there is no need because there's a cable company there, there's a wireless company there. But then you have to determine what the cost of providing broadband to the farms is going to be because I guarantee you, nobody's coming out to the farms. I, you know, I've heard a lot of talk about the donut and the donut hole, but the reality is that in a lot of these areas, that's not the population that we're really talking about. We're talking about areas that were at one time rural that are no longer rural, that are now suburban communities that are being treated as if they're still rural. I mean, the point is there has to be an, a realistic assessment of the need in a particular territory. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, that there may very well be donuts and donut holes in certain areas, but that doesn't mean there doesn't need to be some more critical analysis of those costs. Uh, I, I think it was five or six years ago, I believe Embark did such a study about, you know, getting rid of what they call the uh, implicit subsidy and averaging over a large area and the way I read that study that if you did that for that particular company that they would need more money to support that area that they were supporting by averaging I think that donut in the hole is a real issue I think a lot of our companies you know some of them may be 50 percent some of them 80 percent we don't really we haven't really looked at but the donut in the hole is a real issue if you disaggregate and I think the FCC is, is looked at it rightfully so that they want to disaggregate before they address that donut and the whole issue. I think that's something that really should be done. Disaggregate first, then you can have the data that you're looking for to make that decision. I think the important thing to point out too um, is when you remember what we were doing here is we were subsidizing to provide voice service and, and I, I think it's very instructive if you look at the last competition report where I think it said that the ILEC, the share of ILEC voice access lines, it excludes wireless for reasons that are beyond me, but um, it excludes wireless, but the number, the percentage is down below 70 percent, it's 69 and change. In terms of the ILEC market share, if you will, for interconnected VoIP lines and wireline uh, traditional TDM voice lines, which if you accept what uh, I, what I consider to be a conservative number that 25 percent of the market has gone wireless only that's really translates into about a 55 percent market share and I think if you looked at the minutes the actual voice minutes my guess is for the entire ILEC wireline industry when we talk about voice as a service I would say their market share is probably in the 30s um, and I think that's just, I, I think that just underscores the problem that we have. I think this is a great conversation, but we only have five minutes and I'd like to get one last question. And I think John Baker will ask our last question. Thank you. Uh, near, near the start of our session, Rebecca was uh, asking you all about uh, transition period. And I have a question about that, which is um, uh, during a transition period, how should we structure intercarrier compensation to encourage um, migration to internet protocol transmission uh, technology for, for call termination. 
it's one of our concerns about how terminating uh, uh, carriers uh, um, uh, would want to shift to to IP technology. An IP an IP interconnection too. Sorry. All IP networks. Yes. Uh, so is, is the is the question more of a not how we deal with IP traffic as this morning's panel was, but the transition to an IP network? Yeah, it's about the how well, to design the program to in, to in, to give incentives to shift. I mean, that, that's a good question, and I, and I don't know specifically what you do to incent engineers to move it, but I can tell you that it's starting to move in, in that direction already. Legacy switches are not supported by the vendors in the same way, and so there's at least some evolution as switch capacity gets fully utilized that it, you know, we're out there using utilizing soft switches in our network today. And we do identify that there's efficiencies in those as you go to routers and soft switches versus remotes and hosts. But it's, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's a significant amount of, of investment. While ultimately you become more efficient, you, you still have a lot of replacement that you have to do in legacy networks. But the design of the program doesn't influence uh, the, the speed of that transition? Well, I don't know what the design of the program does or doesn't, right? I mean, ultimately it changes the compensation under the current network, but I don't know that it incents a, a move. I th uh, our guys are putting in a lot of soft switches and replacing the old switches, and soft switches are far cheaper than the old ch switches are. So that they're going to the soft switch. Soft switch enables the companies to send uh, the stuff on an, on an IP basis up to the connecting carrier. There are times when the connecting carrier hasn't uh, changed his end to an IP basis. But as more and more soft switches are deployed, the capability to go to an all IP world is there. And I'm not sure how we design a restructure mechanism. Uh, you know, I, I, I think if, if we get a good restructure mechanism, I think it would be okay because our guys want to got to replace those old switches anyway. And I think a new soft switch not only far being cheaper, but it allows you to send it IP wise. I think one of the risk you have is the longer you make the transition, the less incentive there is to reduce costs. And one of the ways of reducing costs is moving to an IP platform. I mean, there's a joke around our office that Bob's comments early kind of reminded me of, and that was, uh, you know, last one on the PS10, PSDN writes a check for eight billion dollars. You know, that last minute is going to be really expensive, and so I think I think the fact is you you can't avoid making this happen fast. And I I guess the last thing I would say is that if your process and results are going to be data driven, one of the things you need to look at is the the theme that's in the notice of proposed rulemaking that high access charges have disincented the switch, the switch to a broadband network when, of course, it's exactly the smaller carriers that have had the higher access charges that have done more broadband right. build out than the larger carriers. So if you're going to look at the data, which I, we very much support the FCC doing, that's a key datum that you need to look at in terms of one of the fundamental premises behind this pressure to reduce intercarrier compensation. I would, um, I would just caution the commission with this, the obsession with forcing carriers to go to IP because it's going to be cheaper. I, I'm not sure that notion is, is needs to be as, as rammed through as quickly as sometimes I, at least it comes through in documents that I read. This, mar this is happening naturally anyway. And there's, there's not a small cost necessarily to going, you have, a, you have a TDM network that's working perfectly well for certain parts of a rural X network, just let it continue to work. What will really change that and go to IP is when the business model changes. And I'll tell you when the business model is going to change is, on the, is already on the way. It's called 700 megahertz spectrum on L, with LTE built over it. So be careful what you wish for about not subsidizing your backhaul carriers as you've just uh, agreed to build out 20% more LTE. Um, at some point, that, that, that's going to change the business model. Then those customers, then those carriers will be pushing fiber to towers, they'll be pushing fiber deeper in their networks, and that's naturally going to transition to IP. And to, to try and make them go IP quickly, you're, there's a check they're going to have to write, and then that, that causes, and we're already talking about this whole conversation is about companies that don't have enough revenue already. So I would just let that, just let that naturally happen. Well, 
I want to just clarify a point about David. I think the MPRM talks about a disincentive to the IP, IP interconnection, not sort of the entire network. And we're trying to promote goals to, to accelerate the transition. I don't think we're, we, we recognize that these smaller carriers have been using USF and ICC to build out the last mile for the IP. But anyways, it's uh, a little over time, so I wanted to thank our panel today for coming. It was a very engaging discussion. Uh, we will have our second workshop, which will focus on Universal Service and the Connect America Fund on April 27th here at the FCC. So thank you.